All right, Sergeants, you can take it away now. Good morning. Welcome to the remote hearing on a committee on governmental operations. Will council members and staff please turn on their videos at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on their videos at this time? Please place all cell phones, electronics on vibrate. You may send your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for all the staff uh, that made this possible today. Let me gavel in today's meeting. Good morning. I, I am Council Member Fernando Cabrera, Chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations. Today, the committee will be conducting oversight on the administration of elections during COVID-19 pandemic. We will take this opportunity to reflect on the lessons learned from the June primary and plan ahead for the November election. I wanna thank my colleague, colleagues who join us today, Council Member Kalos, Marcel, Perkins, and Yeager. The June primary was unlike any election our city has ever seen following the surge of COVID-19 infections. The governor issued a series of executive voters to ensure that all New Yorkers eligible to participate in the primary could vote, uh, could vote absentee. As a result, the city's board of election received nearly 800,000 absentee ballot applications. That's 12 times the number of applications it received in, in the 2016 primary. Overwhelmed by the flood of requests and U.S. Postal Service delays, the board was placed in a situation where they were delaying sending out many of the ballots. We saw thousands of New Yorkers did not receive their ballots in time for the election. Fortunately, the problems did not end there. Roughly one in five absentee ballots cast in the June primary were rejected by the Board of Elections. In some cases, ballots were rejected because of a missing signature or on CO envelope. In other cases, they were rejected because the post office failed to stamp the envelope with a postmark. Finally, due in part to a large number of absentee ballots cast, the board was delayed in canvassing all the votes. As a result, it was unable to certify the primary results into six weeks after the election. What we witnessed in June has already motivated the state legislature to make changes to the election law that will hopefully make voting in the presidential election smoother. But we are here to ask for a commitment for our local board of election. We're election day just 39 days away and the early voting starting in four weeks. New Yorkers need better planning, clearer messaging and more efficiency. They need to have confidence that their vote will count in a tremendously important election. From poll site selections and poll worker hiring to the administration, of in-person voting and the processing of absentee ballots, the board will rise to the challenge and I'm hopeful that they will. In addition, the board will take, must take all the necessary, uh, all steps necessary to ensure the prompt certification of the election results. Given the stakes of this election, the fragile state of our democracy, we cannot afford to be waiting for election results in December. I wanna thank Mike Ryan at the Board of Election for being available to myself and staff throughout this time as issues have arisen. Thank you for the administration and other stakeholders for raising issues early and often with us as we, are, as we conduct continuous oversight on the election process in New York City. Thank you to the committee staff and additional support staff behind the scenes today for the work on this hearing, including committee counsel C.J. Murray, po uh, policy analyst Emily Ford John and Elizabeth Conk, uh, finance analyst Sebastian Bacci, community liaison John Blasco, and my own legislative and communication director Claire McLevain. I would let me also recognize that we've been joined by council member Aos. And with that, I will now turn it over to our mod moderator, council, committee council, CJ Murray, to go over some procedure items. Thank you, Chair. I'm CJ Murray, counsel to the Committee on Governmental Operations. 
Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony today will be representatives from the New York City Board of Elections, the Campaign Finance Board, and the Mayor's Democracy NYC initiative. For the Board of Elections, testimony will be provided by Executive Director Mike Ryan and Deputy Executive Director Don Sandow. For the Campaign Finance Board, Executive Director Amy Lowprest will be providing testimony. And for Democracy NYC, testimony will be provided by Special Counsel Laura Wood. I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your question. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the committee chair. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Executive Director Ryan, Deputy Executive Director Sandow, Executive Director Lowprest, and Special Counsel Wood, please raise your right hand. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Executive Director Ryan? Yes. Executive Deputy Director Sandow? I do. Executive Director Lowprest? I do. Special Counsel Wood? I do. Thank you. Executive Director Ryan, you may begin your testimony. Uh, thank you. Chair Cabrera and members of the New York City Council Committee on Government Operations, thank you for inviting the Board of Elections in the City of New York to participate in this important hearing. Uh, as I have just been sworn in, I am Michael Ryan. I'm the Executive Director of the Board of Elections, and I am joined uh, at this testimony by the Deputy Executive Director of the Board, Dawn Sandow. Uh, while it's included in our written testimony, I will forego the reading of the uh, legal authority under which the Board uh, operates and get into the, the uh, meat of the testimony. Uh, the Board recently, uh, in August, completed the post-election processes of canvassing the votes of over 800 and 70,000 voters, 50,000 of whom voted early and over 326,000 uh, who voted by the absentee uh, ballot process uh, within New York City. As we all are acutely aware, the spread of COVID-19 has brought with it many challenges. Unfortunately, the board was not spared from the effects of this virus and tragically suffered the loss of several uh, employees uh, due to the illness. I want to stress that the Board of Elections did not close its offices for one day during the entire emergency, not one day. Staff continued to report to our offices every single day during the pandemic, albeit at a reduced rate, but we were open to the public and we continued to conduct our operations throughout the entire pandemic. Uh, the, the board and its staff, and mostly the staff, deserve credit and thanks for their dedication to the voting, voting process. And tragically, in some circumstances, the sacrifice that was made in service to the city of New York, which has unfortunately gone largely unrecognized. The board will continue to persevere throughout the challenges faced to ensure safe access to the voter franchise. I think it's necessary to go back and take a look at June in the proper context. A state of emergency was issued on March the 7th, 2020 uh, by Governor Cuomo, or declared I should say, uh, to ensure that voters were provided an opportunity to vote safely. Two significant changes were made at that time to the absentee ballot process. Uh, the authorization of online application portals, of which the city of New York was one of two jurisdictions in the entire state 
that made such convenience available to its voters. And the mailing of absentee ballot applications to all eligible voters with postage paid return envelopes. On April 27, 2020, within three weeks of executive authorization, the board went live with its online application portal and began receiving applications. The online portal was active for 49 days and 53% of all applications received over 450,000 were processed through the online portal. An executive order issued May 7, 2020 finalized the absentee uh, ballot application mailing process. The mailing of applications commenced on May 18th, one month before the election, a decidedly different circumstance than we find ourselves in now, uh, and was completed by May 21st uh, to over 3.6 million eligible voters. So that was the application mailing that was completed one month before the election. To accomplish this tremendous undertaking, the board outsourced the printing and mailing of the applications and the USPS reported to us that 99% of those applications were delivered in home by May 26th, inside of one month before the primary election. As discussions began regarding potential changes to the process, the board immediately assessed operational needs and necessary changes. Once uh, the orders were finalized, and there were numerous, the board implemented uh, significant changes to its absentee ballot process. Most notably, the board secured a vendor to work around the clock, along with board staff, scanning all returned applications and to provide data files to the board for ease of processing and uh, two vendors to print and mail absentee ballots uh, to voters. And the scanning was in addition to any applications that were received on the portal. Uh, in fulfilling its statutory obligations, the board process and entrusted to the United States Post Office, the delivery of over 775,000 absentee ballots to eligible voters. In comparison, for the 2016 presidential primary, the board processed over 64,000 absentee ballots. And as the chair rightly pointed out, that is a 12 fold increase with, by the way, no notice. Uh, to further the comparison, the board processed a combined total of 335,000 absentee ballots for the 2016 and 2018 general elections. More than double that total, more than double that total was processed in an eight week period in the middle of a pandemic while short-staffed. To ensure the accuracy and integrity of the elections, New York State has one of the most comprehensive post-election canvas and re processes in the nation. The board processed all returned absentee ballots. The law pertaining to the canvas and re applies to absentee ballots and boards of election are mandated to process these ballots in according to the law. When assessing the validity of an absentee ballot oath envelope, boards cannot ignore the law. While the total number of invalid oaths have been subject of recent observation, percent, the percentages are in keeping with uh, previous elections. 2016 presidential primary, 21% invalid. 2016 uh, presidential general election, 13% invalid. 2018, citywide general, 18% invalid, and the 2020 presidential primary, 23% invalid. The overwhelming number of those invalid uh, are oath envelopes are for missing signatures. And we can get into the, during the question and answer period, there's been some changes to the state law that allow for some of that to be rectified. But this is directly analogous to election day. The signature is the gateway to the ballot. If you do not provide a signature, you do not get a ballot. The only difference between election day and absentee balloting is the signature is captured in a different process, but it must be captured nonetheless. And if it's not captured, it's not valid. The path forward 
has required significant changes and we will continue to make more changes, I am sure. Some of which are short term and some of which are long term. In the meantime, the board has made improvements to its online portal and related processes to uh, streamline the processing of applications, both for the voter and for uh, the, the board uh, who has to process it on the back end. The inquiry process has been streamlined to provide voters enhanced information regarding ballot processing and tracking. The ballot tracking system is up and running as we speak. Uh, and voters will be able to avail themselves uh, of that process as they uh, so choose by accessing the board's website at vote.nyc. Given the number of absentee ballot applications, we have prominently featured the both the absentee application portal and the tracker in the center of our website where the scrolling pictures of the cityscape uh, is, is seen so that people will know exactly where to go for their absentee ballot information. And then of course, if they scroll down, they'll be able to see other information. Uh, this week, uh, we announced at our uh, Tuesday meeting that the board has uh, sent out to, the, to its print vendors for printing and mailing this week, over 470,000 completed absentee ballot applications, and those voters should be expecting to get their absentee ballots uh, within the course of the postal delivery process over the next several days. In addition, as of the close of business yesterday, that number increased to 510,000. So we have already sent out for, for mailing over a half a million absentee ballots to voters. We are encouraging the voters to return them back to us as quickly as possible, to not set them aside, to not put them onto the counter in the kitchen or the coffee table. When they get them, vote them, send them back, and that will help everybody. It will allow the voters a convenient way to vote, to maintain social distancing at the poll sites by reduced volume, and it will also help us administratively uh, to complete the tasks that we need to complete in order to accurately uh, tabulate those votes. And in addition, it will provide the maximum period of time to engage in the newly created cure process by state legislature, because it imposes upon the board obligations to contact the voters. And it's, it's a step-by-step -step process, so I'm not going to belabor all the points, but simply said, we now have uh, a legal way and an obligation to address any deficiencies in the absentee ballots with the voters in advance of election day. Clearly, the sooner that happens, the better. If it happens a day before election day, it's gonna be very difficult for uh, the process to be completed. But if it happens now, uh, and somebody made a mistake because they're unfamiliar with the process and forgot to sign their oath envelope, we have time to correct that to ensure that no voters are disenfranchised. Uh, we have uh, increased uh, the system input threshold uh, so that we can accept paper applications at a faster processing rate. And we would ask that we get paper applications from those folks that don't have access to technology. If you have the access to the technology, please go to the website process your absentee ballot request through the portal. That's the fastest, most effective, and safest way for that process to be completed. Uh, we have a voter education uh, uh, campaign uh, that's ongoing. Uh, it's We've titled it uh, Vote Safe NYC, which will, over the course of time, lay out all of the different uh, options, the absentee uh, ballot request process, and, and the completion of that. Uh, we, we prepared a, a video that we expect to, to be out, if not uh, by close of business today, by close of business on Monday, an instructional video on how to fill out your absentee uh, ballot envelope so that your vote uh, counts and that we don't have to engage in a cure process. The bottom line is we wanna give the information to the voters so that they submit it right the first time and we don't have a back and forth 
uh, between us and the voters. And we're providing that information. And there will be a series of uh, such outreach uh, in that regard uh, moving forward. Uh, enhancements have been made to the board's website uh, to increase voter education, and we will be engaging in aggressive media plan, which will which will include all platforms, print, digital, social media. We've worked uh, with the uh, city kiosks. Our information will be available uh, on those uh, locations as well. Uh, and it was successful last go round, and we've built on it, and we think it's going to be successful again. And of course. Uh, anyone who voted in June will be aware of all of the changes that occurred at the poll sites, uh, the signage, uh, all of the PPE equipment that's uh, necessarily been distributed. Everything that we have now become used to as a society here in New York City will be applicable to the Board of Elections. The decals on the floor indicating uh, where to stand. Uh, the, the PPE, the masks will be available. Uh, for June, uh, very quickly, we were able to get antiviral wipes uh, for people to wipe their hands. Uh, we will still have those. However, in addition to that, we will have ADA compliant uh, hand sanitizer distribution uh, devices with a foot pedal so that people could uh, press the foot pedal and get their hand sanitizer in a contactless way. Uh, we have sent out our annual information notice, which will include a FOB and anyone who has gone to uh, any of the big chain grocery stores that have the little FOB that you keep on your keychain with a with a barcode. You'll be able to use that barcode at your early voting location or at your election day vote location to scan that uh, with the poll pad. And it will bring that is an individual barcode for the voter and it will bring up that particular voter's record. So that will obvi uh, obviate the necessity of a poll worker having to manually access the poll pad and look that information up. The key there is speed and contactless. So we want the voters to be able to pro be processed quickly and safely. In addition, at the tables, uh, for anyone who voted, you might have seen the green uh, pens which were a combination pen stylus so that a voter can use the stylus on the poll pad and then take that pen with them to the uh, privacy booth and mark their ballot and then leave with that pen. Uh, the green was the only color we could get on short notice for June. However, uh, we now have one that will be branded with Board of Elections uh, logo on it. So it's clear that it came from us and we'll be able to use those pens and give them as a voting souvenir, if you will, but all under the guise, not of giving away tchotchke, all under the necessity to maintain minimizing cross-contamination. Uh, poll workers will also be uh, wiping down uh, the equipment as necessary pursuant to a specific protocol. And we also purchased and installed before the June election uh, protective shields over the poll pads, which are tempered thin, thin tempered glass, so that they will not be damaged uh, with the alcohol wipes uh, to maintain uh, the cleanliness. Uh, so, in June, the board, in the face of a pandemic, increased its early voting locations from 61 to 79. That represented about a 30% increase of early voting locations. That has now further increased to 88. So from November of 2018 to November of 2019, the number of early voting locations have increased 45% in the city of New York in the face of a national health crisis. That is a significant step forward uh, and it could not be overlooked. That will allow many more opportunities for people to vote early and vote at a time of their choosing. And if they happen to come and there's a line, they can come back later or a different day of the week if that's necessary. Unlike election day, which is uh, uh, that Tuesday is an all or nothing event. Either you're gonna vote or you're not gonna vote. 
this is all about options and safety and security and the health of all of the voters of uh, the city of New York. Um, in addition, uh, there was there were issues, as we know, with the uh, with the uh, delivery in some respects. Now, keep in mind, uh, four out of the five boroughs uh, really did not have uh, too many mail delivery issues. And I would attribute some of what happened on the back end to the compressed time frame under which everyone had to act. So so first, what did the board do proactively? The board took a look at the statute. The statute previously read that temporary absentee ballot applications could be processed no earlier than 30 days, no later than seven days before the election. Under the previous rules, that left a 23-day window to process absentee ballot applications. When we saw that the statute extending the use of the portal and taking it out from under the umbrella of an emergency uh, order by the governor, or an executive order, I should say, by the governor, and putting it into statute, that 23-day window was still uh, in the statute. It was just leftover language. We spoke to the state Senate, we spoke to the state assembly, and we said, the statute is trapping us in a 23-day window that's going to make it impossible for us to process all of these applications if we get anywhere near the volume that we got in June. And in fact, it appears as if we're on track to have more than we had in June. The state uh, assembly and the state uh, Senate acted swiftly and redacted the language of no earlier than 30 days and got a new statute uh, on the governor's desk and that was signed into law. What that enabled us to do was immediately then go live with our absentee ballot application portal and to begin to uh, receive uh, those applications and process them and ensure that those voters that are applying are in fact the voters that should be getting those ballots. That cannot be overlooked either. That is a, in from an elections perspective, that is a really big deal. That is the state legislature responding to a need of an agency, of an entity, recognizing that need, acting expeditiously and getting a law uh, for onto the desk of the governor uh, for changes, and that's a and that's a big deal. The second piece of that, though, is this box sitting next to me here, which doesn't show up so well, maybe on this uh, 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 video. But you know, in the era of social distancing, we're doing the best we can. One of these boxes will be at all of the early voting locations, and it will be at all of our election day locations, and it will be at all of our offices. This box is for voters to drop their absentee, completed absentee ballots into if they choose not to avail themselves of the services of the post office. Now, this is another effort to engage in contactless uh, process at the voting locations. The United, the, uh, the process that the Board of Elections has engaged in uh, prior to now uh, has been that you can drop your absentee ballot at any of the early voting locations or at any of the uh, any of the the election day sites or at our offices. Given the previously relatively small volume of absentee ballots, it's been an underutilized process, uh, but it's been in place. So our poll sites are already aware of and we reinforced that those absentee ballots have to be returned in the case of early voting nightly, uh, in the case of election day at the end of election night, with the remainder of the ballot material to the uh, various offices for processing. Uh, we've been doing that for years. That's not a change. What's going to change here is the volume. The other thing uh, for anybody that's watching this hearing uh, or participating in it, uh, the other thing is you don't have to go to your own poll site to drop off your absentee ballot. You can go to any of the early voting sites, any of the board offices, and any of the election day sites. We consider all of that satellite offices of the Board of Elections 
And if you happen to say live in Queens and work in Manhattan and you dropped it off at a Manhattan location, we will take the responsibility of uh, getting that ballot to Queens for the convenience and the safety of the voter. So that adds, you know, 1,200 election day sites plus another almost 100 uh, early voting sites plus our borough offices will have about 1,300 locations spread out over the period of uh, the nine days of early voting and election day for voters to physically and personally return uh, their absentee ballots if they choose not to uh, go to the post office. Uh, so th that's the high hit kind of 5,000 foot view of, of, of elections during a pandemic uh, and some of the changes uh, that we've made moving forward. Uh, there is one thing I, I almost forgot. Uh, when we talked about the volume of absentee ballots in June, uh, one of the main challenges that we had was responding to requests for copies of envelopes. Uh, and in primary elections, which have a tendency to be more closely contested, we have a we have a a spike typically in requests for absentee ballot envelopes, more so than in a general election. Uh, and there was a lot. Uh, so normally in Queens, we would have about three photocopy machines and staff working on three photocopy machines. This election, we had 13. So one of the things that we've done to aid in the processing of absentee ballots is we have purchased customized mail sorting machines that are sized appropriately for each borough. Those machines will date and timestamp uh, the envelope uh, once, they're, once they're sorted. The public should know that if they do not play brinksmanship with their ballot and they return those ballots early, the postmark uh, or lack of a postmark is not significant. As long as we receive those envelopes before the deadline, we will mark them received and then the postmark will become academic. Uh, so it will be scanned, uh, it will be opened, uh, the outer envelope will be opened, uh, and it will be sorted. And here's the best thing. When we get to the second phase of, of the process and we're gonna go about the business in accordance with the post-election canvas rules to sort and process the oath envelopes, those scanner machines will serve also an added function of, well, two. One, they'll be able to tell us if the signature is missing in the box, right? So that we will be able to engage the voters uh, very quickly uh, in, in, to get their signature on an, on an affidavit uh, that's gonna be part of the new process. But in terms of the busy work, if you will, or the, or the real administrative work of trying to make all those photocopies, those scanner machines will serve as duplex scanners and will create PDF uh, documents of all of those envelopes that pass through. So if somebody does make a challenge and they want their envelopes, we don't have to have workers standing on the side making photocopies of 150,000 absentee ballots, which then have you know two sides, that's 300,000 pages. We can, Potentially, uh, if if requested, uh, we can provide that information on a flash drive or thumb drive, if you will. Uh, or if they want them printed, we can use high speed printers to print them as opposed to staffers uh, standing by photocopy machines, pressing buttons. Here's the significance of that. The less staffers we need doing that type of busy work, the more tables we can open early in the process to uh, complete the, uh, the canvas of the election because they're still open to the public and they're still subject potentially uh, to challenges. So we still have to engage in that process, but this will streamline uh, that much more than was done in June. So then the question is gonna become, well, why didn't you have them for June? There wasn't enough time. We attempted to get them for June. These machines are basically all the same but they are component based and they must be built for the size of your need. 
So the machine that's going to uh, be in Staten Island will be a drastically different size uh, from the number of bins uh, than Brooklyn or Manhattan or Queens. And we tried. Uh, the only potential option which didn't work out was to buy machines from three vendors before June. And that was just not going to work. So we did what we could for June. We got through it. We recognized it. And before the June primary was completed, we started the procurement process uh, to get these machines so that we'll have them in our offices for the first week of October. I think that's all I have. Uh, and I'm certain uh, that there'll be some questions. Thank you so much, uh, Director Mike Ryan, uh, for your testimony. I have quite a few questions. Um, and I'm going to ask you, uh, whenever possible, if you could just give me the short answer, because some of them, uh, <laughs> it's just I have quite a few. And we have. Uh, you got, so you don't want me to take up your five minutes? <laughs> Yeah, there you go. No, no, I get more than five. So I, <laughs> my colleagues that I worry about, and also, you know, as you know, we have CFB and Democracy NYC. Yes, and other testimonies. I will certainly do my best to respect them. So let me let me just start. Let's go back to the June primary. How many absentee ballot applications was DOE expecting to process for the June primary before it began accepting applications in late May? 70,000 or less uh, would have been would have been our guess before but but that it you know it varies from election that's to election good, that's good. there you go mike right. <laughs> that's, okay. that's already i'm breaking the rules I, I have a lot of questions and i want to I got you. Yep. doe reported receiving roughly seven hundred seventy-five thousand absentee ballot application for the june primary how many new yorkers if any were not sent an absentee ballot due to a defect in their application form Due, due to a defect in the form, I'm not certain that I that, that I understand the question. So, if was there anybody who uh, was not sent uh, their ballot due to the actual uh, absentee ballot having a an, uh, a defect? So, in in the past, the defect would have been uh, the lack of a signature would be the the most overriding uh, defect. Uh, and the signature a requirement was waived for June. So uh, I'm not aware of any. And and of the applications that we, we received, we processed all of them and everyone was sent uh, an absentee ballot. So if the form was missing a signature or an open envelope or missing postmark, well, that, uh, that would have been later in the process. I, I think your question was directed towards the application process, because keep in mind, the executive order required us to mail an absentee ballot application to all voters and to provide them a postage paid envelope for which to return the application. So we did receive, uh, you know, a lot of paper applications. But in addition, even though we did that mailing, Still, 53% of the people that requested absentee ballots did it by the portal. Got it. Let, let me move right along. Yep. Uh, I can always come back to that. According to numbers reported by DOE, roughly 50% of the voters who requested an absentee ballot for the primaries ended up voting absentee. How does this percentage compare to prior elections? There is always a percentage of voters, and it's a good percentage of voters that do not they request their absentee ballot and just simply don't return them. So it's co it's comparable to past elections. It is comparable. Okay, how many uh, of the roughly four hundred thousand absentee ballots passed in the June primaries were determined to be invalid? As I testified earlier, it was about twenty three uh, percent of those total. Uh, and certainly we can get you a borrow by borrow breakdown if that's if that's something that you desire. So uh, help me, I, I wanna break it down a little further uh, of those, uh, how many were determined to be invalid based on signature deficiency? Do you have that number? I, don't, I do not have the specific number, but I can tell you that's gonna be the vast majority. Okay, if you could give me that number later on, I would appreciate certainly. it. Certainly. Uh, how many were based on missing postmarks? The, there was ultimately 
uh, less than 100 in each of uh, the four boroughs outside of Brooklyn. And Brooklyn had about 4,500, as I remember it. And that was the subject of litigation. And those uh, there was a court order under certain parameters uh, for uh, the canvas of any of those uh, that were received no later than the day after uh, the June primary, which was the 24th. Incidentally, the state legislature then was in the process of changing the state uh, law. And the new rule is now, if we get uh, an absentee ballot returned with no postmark, uh, and we receive it up to and including the day after election day, which in this case will be November 4th, we are directed to canvas those ballots irrespective of postmark. Were there any other common reasons ballots uh, were determined to be invalid? There, there are, but they, there's numerous, but they really don't occur all that often. If somebody makes an extraneous mark or makes a political statement handwritten on a ballot, uh, then uh, that would be a, a reason. If there's extraneous paper that does not belong in the sealed ballot envelope, that would be a reason. Okay. If if the ballot envelope isn't sealed when we receive it, that would be another reason. However, to work uh, toward uh, better safety and security for our staff and for the poll work uh, for, the, for the voters, we have purchased self-sealing envelopes for the oath envelopes moving forward. So they'll have a, they'll have a peel off sticker uh, that they can uh, close the envelope without having to uh, lick the envelope in the traditional way. Uh, how many poll workers did the uh, City Board of Election hire for June's early voting? Uh, for early voting, it was just shy of 30,000, as 30, I recall. 000, and then for Election Day? No, for, no not for, did you say early voting or for Election yeah, Day? Uh, first was early voting, the second oh, was um, uh, The early voting number I don't, I don't have off the top of my head, but we certainly were well staffed and we supplement that staff with our, uh, with our, our board employees as well. So just to be clear, the 30,000 was for election day. Correct. What was the no yeah, that, would, that would be too much for early voting. What was the no show rate? Uh, it's it's typically in the 15% uh, rate. I think what the borough offices had to do immediately upon their return to work on, on May 8th was they did a, a lot more outreach to the poll workers given the circumstances to determine whether or not there was a willingness to work. In the past, we would simply send out notices to work for people that have uh, been uh, poll workers before. But in this particular case, the borough offices reached out and said, do you want to work? And the folks that said no or were afraid or might be out of the, out of the state, uh, they were marked off. So the borough offices really did their best to make sure that the people that were hired to be the poll workers, in fact, wanted to work and would show up. And I know some of them uh, had difficulty getting there due to the subways being shut down from one to uh, five in the morning. How many voters participated in the early voting for the June primary? It was only about 52,000. And we would certainly like to see uh, that number uh, increase uh, over the course of time. It was, it was slightly less, well, I guess we was about 63,000 in November and then, uh, and then about 52,000 uh, in June, although the November turnout was higher. Okay, uh, the November. Let me move on to the mo November election. We, we, we're doing good here, Mike. We, we're moving. <laughs> okay, uh, my compliments. Uh, so let me talk about the BOE offices. Are BOE offices continuing to operate at lower in-person capacity at this moment? No, we're we're act operating at full capacity, and we're adding temp workers. Uh, to prepare for the uh, post-election canvas mostly and some of the other prep work that needs to be done. Uh, like everybody else, we've had to add, uh, you know, screen shields. Um, our front counters now all have glass. Uh, there's uh, plexiglass that's being installed all over the city. We're providing masks to all of our workers and hand sanitizer and gloves like like everyone else has been forced to do. You got it. You got it. I'm sorry. I got a lot of questions. Uh, so uh, how many, uh, which job responsibility can be conducted from home? There, there's not many uh, that can be done from home. For example, in the lead up to election now, 
a lot of what we do is related to the voter registration system, whether it's actually registering voters or having to access that system. And quite frankly, uh, we cannot expose that system to potential cyber threat by allowing employees to use wireless methods to to um, access the voter registration system. Right. If that were to be uh, uh, tampered with externally by a wireless mechanism, that would be a very uh, difficult situation for us to overcome. Uh, and also, in, uh, regarding the November election, how many absentee ballots does a BOE expect to process in the 2020 presidential election? Well, well certainly more than 780,000. We might, we might approach upwards based on the numbers that we're seeing and the daily trends, upwards of a million absentee ballots this go around. Uh, of the, those who have requested absentee ballots for the general election so far, how many have requested ballots via the portal? The, the majority, uh, I would say it's got to be at least 70%. That would be about my guess of so far, which is an increase from uh, from June. And I think if, if it becomes part of the fabric of what we do moving forward, assuming the law gets uh, re renewed, uh, that will be, the, that's the way to go. I, is, is that, I mean, how do people learn about that? Is it, you did a mailer or it was the public service announcement? We did a mailer, but we also had a very successful social media, you know, all of those various digital platforms that are out there. And I'm not as well versed in that as maybe some of the younger folks are, uh, but they're out there and we blanket uh, the digital media uh, with that. Uh, as well as the uh, as the kiosks in the city and the other old fashioned forms of notification like print media and such. And how many were requested? How many requested ballots over the phone? Minimal, very very few. Uh, and and Miss Consumanis uh, just told me that we also and I forgot this. We also sent out a blast mail uh, in June to all the elected officials asking to share that information. All right. And, and many, and, and we would like to thank uh, those council members, and I understand that it was a large majority of the city council that forwarded that information along to the voters, because at the end of the day, you folks are the eyes and ears uh, of your constituents, and, and getting that information out to them is important. Uh, Mike, I have a lot more questions, but I want to invite uh, my colleagues. I know the, we have members that have questions. I will ask my colleagues uh, to please stick to the five minute uh, time slot. And the reason why is we have CSD, we have NYC democracy, we have tons of uh, groups, uh, the government groups that are gonna be speaking today. Uh, we're gonna be here for a while. Uh, and so we really appreciate uh, if you could stick to that time uh, spot. I'll be coming back. There's some, again, uh, my questions really require just short answers because they're mainly about uh, numbers and statistics. So with that, let me uh, turn it over uh, to, uh, to the council. Thank you, Chair. I'll now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you've not yet raised your hand, please do so now. As the chair mentioned, you'll have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Once I've called on you, please wait until the sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your question. Uh, first, we will hear from council member Powers followed by council member Kalos. Uh, council member Powers, you may begin. Good, thank I'm you. Starts now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, chair. Nice to see everybody and thanks for the questions. Um, I just want to talk about the, just very quickly, and, and thank you to the board for that uh, testimony. Just to go to the drop boxes uh, or the where you can drop. Can you just go back to that and just repeat for people watching? If I have an absentee ballot and I want to drop it off, where can I go to drop it off? Any of the board offices in the five boroughs of the city of New York, and all of that information is available online for each county. And then once early voting starts uh, on the 24th of October, and for nine days uh, thereafter, any of the early voting locations of which there will be 88 in New York City. And then on election day, for those folks that really get to the end of the line, any of the almost 1200 poll sites that we're gonna have in operation citywide. And I wanna just reinforce councilman, 
it doesn't matter if you're in your borough of residence. Right. You can drop it to us anywhere, and we will take the responsibility of getting that to the proper borough. The idea is to make it as convenient for the voter uh, as we possibly can. Does that include on election day? I can go to a polling place that's not my polling place and drop it off, and then it will get sent to the place that it is where it needs to go? 100%. Okay. So if I get an absentee ballot, I can sit down, I can fill it out at home, I, I send a mailing it in, I can go drop it off. Obviously, alternately, I can just mail it in. Um, and if I am mailing it, when I mail it in, if this, this is an alternate set, is I think when Jan June, is, is it prepaid postage on the absentee ballot? If you know, I see you shaking your head. It is, it is, it's not prepaid postage for the absentee ballot return. Okay. It was in June or it's, it wasn't? It was in June by executive order. That executive order was not extended and the statute was not amended. Okay. So this time you got to pay for your own stamps. Is that fair to say? Correct. Okay. How many stamps does a uh, New York need to put on it? It, it depends on the, uh, on, the, on the size of the ballot, but it would be in the order of 55 cents, but it really, it depends. So that would be something that the post office would have to determine based on weight. Oh, so you don't you we don't know how many stamps somebody's got to put on it. We, but what's the determining factor here? Well, it postage is determined by the weight of the package. So, for example, uh, Queens has a uh, for absentee has two pager. Uh, so the price in Queens is going to be different than the price in the other boroughs. I, 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 I understand the logic behind it, but I would tell you that I think I think I think I'm, we're going to get this question actually from folks who as they're doing this. And I didn't know this answer. So I would think that you'd want to give them some guidance. I mean, I think either try to determine ahead of time, uh, you know, I, I, I understand like you may, but I do think it's probably, probably worth our time to figure out what the answer to that is for folks when they, we get inevitably get the phone call from a dozen people asking how many stamps I put on this thing. For its work. It's going to be at least 55 cents, but really it's like anything else that you mail you need to check with the post office when you're sending out uh, an item that might be of, of, a, of a different weight. Okay, I'm just saying, I think it's a thing of board and I think about trying to provide guidance on. Um, when do we, I'm gonna switch switching topics, but thank you for that and I'll uh, follow you guys on. Um, when do you anticipate that you have completed results for this election? Uh, well, it depends on the volume that's received clearly. Uh, the other thing, uh, that we have to take into consideration uh, pursuant to a, a federal uh, consent decree, I believe it was between the, the DOJ and the State Board of Elections. Uh, information has to be exchanged amongst all 62 counties uh, regarding voter history. So, well, and that's okay. a point. Am I correct to say that you can send in your absentee ballot up until the day, it's got to be postmarked the day of the election? Is that correct? Yes, but but now there's another layer to it. Vote by mail is one thing. Absentee balloting is something else. In New York State, if you choose to request an absentee ballot and you're entitled to one and there's, the definition is expansive this go round, you can do that. And you can also vote on Election Day. Right. So what would happen then is we check your voter history. And if you voted by machine, we then invalidate your absentee ballot that you mailed in. Even if my absentee okay. So what if right. I, is it the first one that is, it, is it based on the order? It's just, you just invalidate the absentee one. The absentee gets invalidated because there's no way to back a vote out of the machine once it's voted. Oh, okay, okay, I gotcha. Okay, so my-, my right. Time question, expired. My last question goes five minutes. How long do you anticipate? And I actually would appreciate an answer. That's a like a like an actual set of days. Not holding it to this, just question. How do you? How long do you anticipate that it will take to process the absentee app ballots for this? Have you just did it? How many weeks? I'll say weeks or how many days do you think it will take for the board of elections to process the absentee ballots for this November's election? Well. We have to complete certification in order for the electors to be seated in the Electoral College. Uh, so I would say in the December 8th, December 15th range is going to be about the right number. But uh, we're working on all of that. And the idea is to try to get it done as quickly as we possibly can. We don't want to play brinksmanship either. 
Yeah. Okay. So there's a there's some Okay. Thank you guys. I'll hand it back over. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Councilmember Kalos. Councilmember Kalos, you may begin. Time starts now. Thank you to Chair Cabrera for your leadership and for securing a promise from the Board of Elections to give concise answers to questions. I have four questions. I hope we can get through all of them in the time allotted. I want to thank uh, you, uh, Executive Director Mike Ryan, for your support for Local Law 65 of 2016 when it was first heard in 2015 and your recent implementation of the absentee ballot tracking system. Just a quick question. Any reason it took four years and didn't get implemented in time for the mayoral race in 2017, let alone for the presidential primary in June 2020? Uh, Councilman, I think you're well versed in the reason. And the reason was the entire online application uh, portal process was tied to the signature requirement. And it was not possible for us to do that until the signature requirement was resolved. It has now been resolved, at least temporarily, to be no longer an essential element of the online application process. So it was by no uh, lack of will, uh, but it was due to a lack of legal support uh, for doing it. I appreciate the, the clear and concise answer and, and I have long been frustrated by uh, Albany as well. According to Gothamist and WNYC, the school's chancellor, Richard Carranza, sent you a letter on September 11th of all days, refusing to let the Board of Elections use 20 school buildings and nine learning bridges locations for early voting as well as election day itself, when I seem to recall that students will have the day off. What will be the, the impact on voters if the schools restrict access on election day when students won't be in the building? So, so first and foremost, I would like to thank the staff at the Department of Education for the very close working relationship that we have with the Board of Elections and the very good communications that we have at a, at a staff level uh, back and forth regarding these matters. The sites that are in question were designated on March the 15th as required by uh, state law. Uh, they were used uh, in June. 15 of the 20 locations that are schools have entrances that are directly from the street to, uh, to the polling uh, location and don't require traversing anywhere else. The NYCHA sites were also um, designated uh, by, uh, by the board in June. And I would suggest that, I'm, I'm sorry, in March, and I would suggest that if somebody was going to have an alternative use for a location that was as important as involving the safety and security of the students, that they would find out what else was going on in those locations before they will move forward with a plan to designate. That would have been, I think, a, a good operational way to handle it, but uh, far be it for me to tell others how to run their uh, shops. Uh, but in any event, uh, we cannot conduct early voting in the way that we want to while maintaining the social distancing and providing as many convenient locations for the uh, folks to vote without these 29 sites. And it's past the hour by which we can uh, move along. We have to set the sites, the, the ballots up for those locations and the machines that are gonna be deployed have to be tested. It's not, we, it, these are not photocopy machines that we just can move from office to office. System integrity is paramount uh, with these things and we can't deploy machines that haven't been tested. And we worked very closely all year long, but most particularly from June to now with the staff at the Department of Education and everyone knew what was going on and nobody told us that there was a problem. And I'd also say that I have a phone that works and getting a phone call instead of a letter on a Friday might've been a better way to have that initial communication. Is, is, if there's anything we can do to help resolve that does not seem to be an ideal situation, I'm, I'm happy to discuss it further. I do have two additional questions. On August 24th, 2020, Governor Cuomo issued an executive order 202.58 requiring the New York City Board of Elections to send staffing plans and needs to the State Board of Elections by September 20th so that the State Board can assist in ensuring adequate coverage. Did you do so? Will you have enough staff particularly to get timely results when Trump may refuse to accept the results of the election? Uh, along the similar vein, on September 9th, 2020, Governor Cuomo issued Executive Order 
that all boards should develop a plan to allow registered voters to drop off a completed absentee ballot without requiring they wait in line with in-person voters. Was that plan submitted to the Board of Elections by September 21st, by, to the State Board by September 21st, 2020 as requested? And will the absentee ballot drop-off locations be announced? How Time many expired. Where will they be located? Okay, so very quickly, we will not comment on any uh, candidate for political office, especially one during an election. Number one, number two, the box to my uh, to my uh, left over here is an element of the dropping off the ballots contact list way. Uh, we are working with the state board of elections to finalize the plans uh, for the uh, the staffing plans for post election canvas, and that in some respects will be dependent upon what additional space may be available to us because we're finalizing larger venues uh, to do the post-election canvas process uh, outside of traditional office locations in at least four of the five boroughs. We're going to try to do that. And ju just to be clear, uh, regardless of the name of the person, taking out the name of the person, would, do you support that if there's an election, the elected official should leave that office if they do not win that election? That's not for me to say. Uh, I, 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 it is. I think that I, uh, was a softball. I, uh, I, I need to. I, need I, I, I pledge, if I ever lose an election, to to leave that office. I'll well, if, I, 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 I'll administer the elections. That's I'll make this pledge, do. Councilman. If you lose an election, I'll call for you to leave office. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman Kalos, you have one last question. That was it. I'm good. <laughs> what was that, uh, Councilman Kalos? I, I, I am done, despite our disagreement about whether or not the president should leave office. No, no, no. I was. Uh, I know you have one more question. You have four questions. If you could just get the last one real quick. I, I, I got my fourth question. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos. We appreciate it uh, about him, uh, about the time, and and, and very good questions. Uh, any other council members, uh, Council? No, no other council members. So yeah. feel free to ask uh, further questions, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, and Director. Uh, Ryan, thank you for um, giving me those concise answers. So we're going we're gonna to continue in that vein. So I, I wanted to ask you, is the absentee ballot tracking system only available to voters who request their ballots through their online portal? No, it's available to everyone. To everyone. Fantastic. You know, now there's certain information that you would need in order to be able to get the information, but it's available to everyone. And, and let me just say, uh, personally speaking, uh, that has uh, put me more in um, uh, assurance mode. Uh, the fact that we have this tracking uh, system, uh, I read things online, um, and even uh, the media has reported uh, that in certain places, it comes in in a box and then disappear. The tracking system, uh, I commend uh, the board for, for having this on, so thank you. In August, uh, the New York Times reported that DOE put 34,000 ballots in the mail just one day before the June primaries. When does DOE expect to have all the absentee ballots mail out for the November election? It depends on when the voters send them to us. Uh, and the purpose of including the other numbers in my testimony uh, was to show how many we got very, very close to election day. In June, we got from June 16th to June 21st, we got almost 80,000 paper applications that were processed. And despite that 34,000 number, it was really 26,000. Uh, and we arranged for our vendors to hand deliver those uh, to, to the post office. We got to stress to the voters, all of us, get your applications in early. So if you get it on election day, do you still mail it? We, if we get any timely application we get, we mail, we have to by law, even if we know that it's not going to get to the voter, we have to do it. We don't get to pick and choose. Got it. All right. How many absentee ballot drop boxes will be available at each, at each polling site? Uh, in other words, can there be more than one? Right. So right now, uh, the, the plan is uh, to have one and to have it adjacent to the uh, the information table. Just one. Right. Okay. Uh, do you think that's enough? 
Yes, because we have a process in place for those boxes to be uh, emptied by a bipartisan team throughout the day. So that that Got that it. box will never uh, fill up. So once a drop box has been filled to capacity, you have a bipartisan team that Correct. comes in. On the top of the uh, of this box here, and I know it's going to be difficult to see, no, there will be a red seal. There'll be a red seal, like the red seals that are on the voting machine. And when we have to deal with a voting machine on election day, that red seal can be cut, and the number is written down with the barcode, and it's uh, taken care of by a bipartisan team. If we have to do that for uh, election day, we'll have a red seal here. That red seal will be cut. And then a new red seal will be put on. And then this back door slides up and down. Uh, and, and you can see on the back side, it's clear. So the side that faces the public will be private. The side that faces the staff will have a clear window so that they'll be able to see if the, if the bin is filling up. And they're taken to the, uh, to the central office by who? Yes. So... There is already a process in place uh, for the, the collection of absentee ballots, and we've been doing it for years. They go into uh, an envelope, and in this case, maybe envelopes, and all of that is then kept locked until the end of the voting day, whether it's early voting or election day. And then the New York City Police Department transports all ballot material from the poll sites to uh, the board offices, and then they're dealt with accordingly uh, at the offices. Okay, on the new state law, voters whose absentee ballots have a defect or a missing signature will be able to cure the defect, as you mentioned, by submitting a new information. How does the board plan to notify voters if the ballot has a curable defect? Does the board expect to be able to contact most voters by email or phone? If the board contacts a voter via email, would it take steps to ensure the email has been received? And can you please describe the board's plan for processing the QR information it receives? So we're, st we're still in, in the process of finalizing that. Keep in mind, we only got the, uh, uh, the details of this last Friday, uh, although it's been brewing for a while. Uh, so there's, as you indicated, there's an email process, then there's a series of phone calls uh, that, need, that need to be made and a mailer that needs to be made. So we're automating the mailer so that we can offload that administrative responsibility from the borough offices. We'll have a, a centralized uh, email and uh, the phone calls will have to be done by the individual offices. Great, uh, let me get now, move on to election results. When would the board begin tallying absentee ballots passed in the November election? So in some respects, that depends on when we get the notification from the State Board of Elections that it's okay to commence, uh, because all of the voter history for all 62 counties uh, of, in, in New York must be completed before we can tally absentee and affidavit ballots. Uh, so that if somebody voted uh, in one county uh, on the machine, and they voted in another county either by absentee or affidavit, that vote, the affidavit can't count and the, and the absentee can't count. So we're going to have to uh, get the information from the State Board of Elections, which we're supposed to get within 48 hours. And then you would figure it would be on the order of the normal five days uh, from Election Day uh, to the day that we start opening, keeping in mind that we will also probably have less numbers of contests that require photocopies of ballot envelopes, which was a big chunk of the slowdown in June. Got it. Uh, what percentage of the votes does the board expect to have counted when it reports their unofficial results on election night? Well, we'll, we'll process you know, it, on the order of 96, 97% always of what's on the machine. And then we'll have a better sense of how much of the overall percentage that's going to be because we'll have close to final absentee numbers the closer we get to election day. Do you, do you, do you think it will resemble what we just saw in June, that percentage? 
I know you're guesstimating, but we're seeing we're seeing a lot. We're seeing a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, requests now. But also, uh, council member, you, you also have to remember that just because somebody requested an absentee ballot doesn't mean they're going to return it. Exactly. Right. And they also may vote. Which would then take them or it would take it wouldn't relieve us of the administrative burden of processing uh, their their application and sending them a ballot but it would ultimately invalidate their ballot, but for a good reason. The good reason would be that they've they've already voted. Mike, let me ask a question. Isn't it, getting back to Council Mayor Powell's question, uh, isn't it better just to tell everybody, put three stamps on the envelope, that way there is no question that it's gonna get there. It actually saves you, um, you know, a later headache, uh, it's, it's just a safe mode. You know, we're talking about a- So we, we discuss that administratively and we print up millions of envelopes. Keep in mind that for every one request, it's three envelopes, right? And so one of those envelopes is the, is the return envelope. The, the cost of postage will vary from election to election. And so we have a form ballot envelope that we want to be consistent from election to election. And then it's going to vary in this election from borough to borough. And with the advent of ranked choice voting, that variation may even uh, be further if there's two and three page ballots. I get that, Mike. But what I'm getting at, we know that if they put three stamps, regardless of the size, it's going to get there. I, I, I don't see people paying more than, you know, needing more than three stamps. So the safe mode is to tell everyone, you know, put three stamps in your right. safe. Because, you know, so, it, the average person is not here to go to the post office to get it weighted. Uh, right. If, yeah, they just go to their early voting site and go vote or just put it in there. I, I think what we can do is ask uh, this question of the post office and see if there's a reasonable message that we can share, you know, uh, on, our, on, our, on our website. Uh, I don't want to do anything that's going to mislead anybody either. Yeah, no, definitely. I, and I tell you that if you had that in the record, then, uh, you know, it's out of your, you know, out of your hands. And now it's in the post office, you know, right. they're, they're the ones who will get the blame. <laughs> it's not too hard to get wrong, right? Uh, okay, uh, cybersecurity, briefly, uh, what kind of measures do we have in place? So this will be very brief. We work very closely with the uh, Cyber Command Office in New York City, as well as all levels of government, State Board of Elections, uh, the Departments of Homeland Security, both on the federal uh, and state level, as well as the FBI and the NYPD. Uh, and we're buttoned down and we're doing everything we can, as well as everyone else is doing everything they can to make sure of that security. Have you had people try to infiltrate uh, lately? Uh, so, it's the board's policy not to discuss uh, any matters of uh, cyber security issues in, in a in a public forum. That's that's I fully understand. Uh, really quickly, if you could give me some numbers, how many poll workers does the DOE typically hire for presidential elections? North of thirty-seven thousand. Thirty-seven thousand. How many? Polls last time, I think we had forty-two thousand in the presidential. Okay. Uh, how many poll sites interpreters does it typically hire? Uh, it depends. It depends on the borough, uh, but we certainly meet our uh, our interpreter uh, requirements. I typically get those informations based on the percentage of vacancies, not on the overall number. Uh, and so we we usually fill them without uh, too much issue going up to election day. Sometimes, although we've gotten uh, more response, we've made some outreach. We would, in the past we had problems getting Korean interpreters in Queens, uh, but that has uh, that situation has greatly improved. So how many poll workers are we short as of today? As of today, we're not short. Uh, we're in the process of, uh, of training and uh, we, we have gotten a very, very good response to our overall outreach. Oh, that's good to hear. Uh, would the board offices be capable of processing the large number of new applications in time for poll worker training? We early voting and election day. For poll workers? Yes, uh, for, for the training, 
including early voting and election day. I know you're going to use a lot of the people who already have experience for early voting, right. uh, the most experienced people. Uh, but will are we able to get it all done in time? So, so the answer is yes, and we have. Uh, gone to some non-traditional locations to provide larger uh, space so that we can main, uh, maintain social distancing as well. That's great. Is there any application process infrastructure at the central office? And if so, is the infrastructure at the central office able to process the application received by the borough office? So, so we, we push people to the electiondayworker.com portal. Uh, so it has really uh, streamlined uh, the, the paper application process. And uh, Ms. Sandow actually uh, spearheaded an effort with uh, our staff and NICAPs to do data file. A, a data file so that we can do the social security number screenings uh, very quickly. Uh, that used to be a one-by-one -one, uh, process and now we're doing them in batches of 10,000. And for the 17-year-old, where, do, I, when do, uh, where do, I, do they apply and when would the application for student poll worker uh, be available? So uh, they apply also through electiondayworker.com. Uh, uh, That's available already, right? It's already available and it's available all year round. It just really gets attention uh, as the election events are showing up, okay. uh, are coming up. We mentioned it today. Awesome. Uh, there are multiple national and local advocacy organizations promoting poll worker hiring opportunities. Some of these Outreach efforts are coordinated with the city DOE. Are applications from third party portals being routed to the board? So there was a national effort uh, and I had spoken with uh, Ms. Lerner from Common Cause uh, and we, we were supposed to be getting a, a, a spreadsheet with, a, with additional workers. Um, I uh, was out of the, the office yesterday morning uh, and I, I did not check my emails yet today uh, for that particular thing. I might have it already, but it, it was supposed to be coming within the last few days in the form of a of an Excel spreadsheet of additional individuals. How many uh, poll worker trainings have you had already since March? Well, since uh, since March, it's actually been since now uh, and it's, it's underway and I'd have to check with uh, each individual borough the, and we're also, uh, doing an enhancement uh, with an online training uh, uh, process, particularly for uh, poll workers that have uh, already worked with us uh, numerous elections. If your staff could send us that info, that would be really helpful. Uh, how is the BOE supporting disabled voters? Uh, we actually got praised by uh, the disability rights advocates for our quick response to the requirement for ADA accessible ballots uh, in, in, in the June election. Uh, and they pointed to the city of New York, DRA did as a model for how uh, these apps and these uh, applications should be processed. But June, we processed 44 ADA uh, applications uh, and we're already over a hundred uh, such applications. And, yeah. and what are you uh, doing? To, and thank you so much, uh, Director Ryan for that. Uh, and thank you for moving quickly on that. I, what about those who don't have their own printers and don't have legal size paper? Well, for the ADA, are you, are you saying? Yes, yes, for the uh, electronic ballot. We, we have the ballot marking devices at the poll sites, but uh, we, and, we and, at our, and our general, op at, at our borough offices, uh, but we, did exactly what was asked to be done uh, as a settlement of a lawsuit that was filed against the State Board of Elections. So whatever process we're following for the ADA accessible ballots, we're following it because there was a settlement on a lawsuit by the advocacy groups and the, and the, and the State Board. So could trusted organizations provide support in printing and delivering ballots? I'm sorry, you came in a little muffled. Sure, sorry. Could trusted organizations be provided, provide support in printing and delivering uh, ballots? Uh, no, I, it, that needs to happen under the, um, uh, under the umbrella and under the auspices of the boards of elections throughout the state. Okay, let me move on to uh, nursing homes uh, quickly and DOC facilities. How is the BOE ensuring the individuals living in nursing home have access to absentee ballots in a timely manner? And will the BOE provide an on-site pickup 
of completed ballots? The uh, State Board of Elections completed the ballots on September the 9th. Uh, and the following uh, week, the, the Board of Elections met its obligations with respect to militaries overseas uh, and nursing home residents and mailed out all of the applications that we had received to date uh, to all of those uh, folks. And permanent. Oh, and the permanent absentees as well, correct. That's great to hear. How, how is the CDBO ensuring that justice involved individuals in city jail have access to act, uh, absentee ballots uh, when eligible? And how is the BOE coordinated with the Department of Corrections to ensure timely ballot casting? So in the past, we had received, uh, you know, uh, requests uh, from uh, the Department of Corrections with respect to, uh, you know, assisting them. Uh, we set up a process several years ago, and quite frankly, uh, it hasn't bubbled to the surface, at least to me, uh, in that time. And so my response to things like this is if it's not coming to me as a problem that then the process that we established uh must be uh effective and working because i'm sure if there was an issue we'd hear about it okay so let me talk about uh, let's go to poll sites real quickly uh is the board in negotiation with any cultural institution to serve as early voting location uh yes we we, we have some forged some partnerships with some of the cultural institutions and uh that's a great thing and and i think some of them have been pleasantly surprised at what a boon to their institution having people come in and see what they have to offer has been i will say this and i'm not going to publicly call out uh, anyone but you know you you folks are in you have your districts you know you, you know your districts there have been some cultural institutions that exist largely uh, with respect to tax breaks and, uh, and, and government funds that have been less than charitable uh, when it comes to hosting a, a, uh, an election, whether it be for early voting or for election day. If we That's want this fun. process to work, we need all of the players to chip in. And quite frankly, a lot of the cultural institutions uh, have, uh, have really uh, not been good neighbors. Well, one of the most sacred process for democracy to take place in this uh, country of ours uh, is the elections. Uh, I, I, it's my hope that there will be a change of heart uh, with these organizations. And uh, we're literally gonna have to at one point call them uh, into action, positive action uh, to open the doors, especially since they're getting city funding, state funding, and at times federal funding. Would the, uh, the board eventually offer universal polling locations for early voting or would it continue to assign poll sites based on voters' home address? And, and I know Director Ryan, uh, we have spoken about the challenge that the machines only have a certain amount of memory uh, and this is why um, it, it makes it impossible at this point, uh, but do you foresee maybe later on, obviously not for the November election, uh, that uh, there could be, you know, we could upgrade this machine and the state could help us in this manner. Yeah. I, I think that that question might be a better posed for a, a later panelist uh, uh, because we can only use the equipment that's certified for use. And the right now, I'm certain that the ballot marking device was a good device in its day, uh, but its day has passed. And it doesn't meet uh, the needs of a of a city with the volume of voters that we have and with the diversity that we have, because one of the main challenges is the insufficient memory capacity to support the audio files that are required to be on those machines so that our blind uh, voters can have the ballot read to them or site challenged uh, can have the ballot read to them. Those audio files take up a lot of room and there's insufficient memory on those uh, machines uh, to be able to read all of the various ballot styles uh, that are required for each location. And that's why we're still in this regionalized uh, early voting uh, scenario. If we, if we can overcome that challenge, uh, I, I think that the board would like nothing less than to put that issue to bed and move on to some 
other issues and make voting as convenient as we can for all the voters. Mike, you know, for the June primary, some voters have their election day poll sites changed at the last minute. Does the board expect last minute poll site changes for the November election? And how would the board inform voters when the poll site has changed, if they do change? So the answer is we never expect last minute poll site changes, but they do happen. And in June, uh, one of the main challenges, which does not seem to be presenting itself to us now, is we had a lot of uh, places that weren't having any employees report to work. And we couldn't get people on the phone to confirm whether or not their sites were even going to be open for June. That has lessened uh, throughout the summer and, and it really isn't presenting a challenge. But uh, if, if we do have an emergency poll site move, uh, like we did a few years back when JFK school had a gas leak or something, uh, we have to move it. And then uh, we send out, uh, the system generates, once that poll site move is processed, the system generates a notification uh, to uh, the voter that gets mailed, but, but it's also available on the social media uh, platforms as well as on our, our website. And then- We're almost done with the questions here, but I, I really need to talk about the BOE budget. Um, as you know, uh, the BOE fiscal 2021 adopted budget totals 135 plus million dollars and does not include funding for early voting, which was budgeted at 75 million for fiscal 2020. How much, uh, how much funding does BOE need to cover all expenses for early voting? Have you had conversations with OMB about it? Uh, what steps uh, uh, you have taken to make sure that estimated costs associated with early voting are covered uh, for their November general election? And do you anticipate BOE will receive state and federal funding uh, to cover operation costs associated with early voting in fiscal 2021? So on the last one, with, with respect to state and, and federal funding, to the extent that there are grant packages uh, available uh, for state and federal, we participate uh, and we complete all of that paperwork. Any of that money would not then come back to the Board of Elections. It would be dropped into the general fund of the city of New York. So, and most of those are on a reimbursement basis. Uh, so with respect to your, your, your first question, at the end of the fiscal year last year, by the end of the fiscal year last year, uh, given the number of canceled uh, elections and the adjustments that were made, uh, the, the city board of elections returned the mid forties, about $45 million back to the coffers of the city of New York uh, to be responsible fiscal partners with the city. The first uh, cut was about $31 million. And then we did about 12 or 13 more million after that, if my, if my memory serves me correctly. Uh, and I, the Office of Management Budget was very appreciative of that. And so we all know that the city is facing daunting fiscal challenges. So the process that we've worked out with the Office of Management and Budget is we're not in a typical budgeting year where you would get a certain amount of money and spend against it so that we're not making obligations that end up not being utilized. And, we're, and we are working with them and they're being informed of our expenditures and we're more or less operating, uh, as I understand it, on a pay-as-you-go. Uh, so we're, money is not uh, an issue for us in that sense, uh, but I think we're there and that OMB trusts us to be there because we did our part to bail the city out of its fiscal difficulties toward the end of the fiscal year last year. Right, and let me just uh, close uh, by asking regarding ranked choice voting. Uh, can the board provide an update on its preparation for implementing, implementing ranked choice voting? Uh, has the board procured the necessary tabulation software? If so, can you give us some specifics regarding which software uh, was selected? Uh, and what uh, other steps do you need to take uh, to ensure uh, that in time of special elections in 2021, 
we are ready for rank choice. The other steps uh, first, that's gonna involve a public education plan. We engaged in a very effective public education plan for early voting, uh, which brought in all of uh, the, the good government groups and other interested parties into the process so that we could essentially test our messaging uh, and get feedback as to whether it was going to be effective. The early voting messaging was effective. Uh, and again, I had a conversation with Ms. Lerner uh, recently and uh, advised that we intend to engage in that same process uh, for ranked choice voting so that when we put our message out, uh, it will be as, as effective as we can possibly uh, make it and then partner with everyone to help share the load of distributing the message. With respect to the ranked choice voting, we submitted, uh, we timely submitted the report that was required uh, to the mayor and, and, and to the speaker of the city council. I believe I shared a uh, copy of that with the chair of this committee. Um, and we had a recent conversation in the last several days uh, with the executive staff at the state board of elections regarding the process of vetting potential vendors and how we move forward. So the, the software that we need is not overly complicated, right? It's gonna be a question of getting software that can take the election results and uh, run the election results through the software so that the algorithm appropriately assigns the votes to the individual uh, to the individual candidates. It's uh, the, the vendor that we currently have has such a system, uh, but we want to explore other options, uh, and we're working uh, with the state board of elections uh, to get uh, a final answer on whether or not. Uh, the state board will be required to either do an approval process similar to what was done with the poll pads or whether it's going to be a full certification. And depending on which way the state board decides to go in that regard, uh, that will uh, adjust uh, what we do moving forward. But I can tell you, we, we have discussed the various options and we have, you know, a preference and then you know, some backup or contingency plans in the event that the procurement process is not completed by the time that we conduct our first ranked choice voting contest, which with all of the rumors that are going around uh, in the city, it looks like it's getting closer and closer uh, from, from the June date. Let me ask a question, why uh, not use the software from the ES and F? So we want to make sure that we're using the most effective and most up-to-date uh, version of a software. And since it's not something that we have a particular area of expertise in, we just didn't want to default and essentially take the lazy way out and say, well, this company already has it, so let's use that. We want to make sure we're doing the right thing. And you know, if we run out of time and as a backup, we have to use the ESNS version. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. We just don't have any other basis of comparison. And so the other thing that, you know, that, that we've discussed is if we use an outside software, it will serve like a quasi audit, but you'll have a completely independent software not related to uh, the tabulation system. Now it won't be a legal audit and won't have any like authority in that regard, but it will give us potentially greater confidence that it was done accurately. Mike, uh, Don, thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Thank you for your answers to this voluminous amount of questions that I had. Uh, we'll have a few more that we'll send uh, to you and if you could get back to the ones uh, that you didn't have readily available. Uh, I know you have a challenge before you. I know uh, that uh, the good news is you have more time now uh, to do, you were in crunch time, 30 days to do what you had to do last time uh, back in June. So uh, looking forward, working together, whatever we could be a support, please let us know. We wanna make sure that uh, no one gets disfranchised uh, during uh, this voting season and uh, it will be as expeditious and efficient as possible. Uh, and so with that, uh, 
I'm going to turn it now to our moderator, our committee council, uh, because we have other testimonies uh, coming. Thank up. you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Next, we will hear testimony from Amy Lowprest, Executive Director of the Campaign Finance Board. Executive Director Lowprest, you may begin when ready. Good morning, Chair Cabrera, members of the Committee on Governmental Operations. My name is Amy Lowprest, and I'm the Executive Director of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the administration of the June primary election in New York City. In the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, the New York City Board of Elections was tasked with administering an election, building an absentee ballot infrastructure for all voters in a city where historically votes are mostly cast in person presented a massive administrative burden for the Board of Elections. The Board of Elections had no clear guidance from the federal government about how to safely conduct an election and dealt with last minute administrative changes from the state legislature, governor and New York State Board of Elections. The BOE and its staff should be applauded for their hard work throughout these trying circumstances and for conducting a safe and socially distanced election. As you know, the CFB is mandated by the New York City Charter to encourage and facilitate voter registration and voting by all eligible residents of New York City, but particularly among underrepresented populations. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have focused on providing New Yorkers with accurate election information as the date of the election, the voting method, what races would be on the ballot, and other factors were constantly changing to reflect state legislation, breaking court decisions, and executive orders issued by Governor Cuomo. In order to respond to these constant changes, the CFB, along with the Mayor's Democracy NYC initiative, formed an elections consortium with good government groups, community-based organizations, and voting advocates to disseminate accurate and consistent election information to voters. Our analysis shows that the communities the hardest hit by COVID-19 are the same neighborhoods where turnout is historically lower. We are working to ensure that these same communities are engaged for the November election. The CF projects voter turnout to reach 70% in November, meaning as many as 3.3 million New Yorkers will cast a ballot this fall. With paper-based registration options less viable throughout the pandemic and no universal voter registration for New York City voters, NYC Votes has teamed up with TurboVote to create a platform to get more New Yorkers registered to vote and does not require access to a printer. The TurboVote platform is simple and easy to use and we hope it will allow many New Yorkers to register or change the registration ahead of the October 9th registration deadline. It is essential that we continue to provide New Yorkers with up-to-date and accurate information in an election year filled with uncertainty and misinformation. With no end to the pandemic in sight, we can use our experiences from the June primary election and apply them to the November and beyond. We have heard from voters at our July 1st Voter Assistance Advisory Committee hearing about their experiences voting in June. Many voters noted their frustration regarding the absentee ballot process. Thankfully, the BOE and state legislature have already taken steps to improve this process ahead of the November election. Many absentee ballots were invalidated due to issues not entirely the fault of the voter, such as postal service delays or inconsistent postmarking procedures. Voters have also indicated on social media that they did not have a way of fixing absentee ballots that were invalidated for not having a signature or being improperly sealed. Others mentioned that election law did not allow the BOE flexibility to count ballots that were mailed timely but did not have a postmark. The state legislature addressed these concerns by passing legislation requiring the BOE to accept ballots missing a postmark and received the day after the election and permitting voters to fix an invalid absentee ballot. These are vital pieces of legislation that make the absentee ballot clearer for the BOE while also helping voters ensure their vote is counted. And we congratulate all the state legislatures legislators, many from New York City, who helped make those laws a reality. Many voters at our VAC hearing said that they had submitted an application and never received an absentee ballot, or their ballot arrived too late to send back to the BOE. The BOE has independently taken steps to improve the experience of voting by absentee ballot. Alongside their excellent online absentee ballot request portal, they have recently implemented an online absentee ballot tracking system that allows voters to track the status of their absentee ballot. 
The tracking website will allow voters to have up-to-date information about when their the absentee ballot application has been received and processed and the date the BOE mailed their absentee ballot. Through the tracking systems, voters will now be able to proactively address issues related to their absentee ballot requests. Also, as a result of the new state law allowing voters to fix certain invalidated absentee ballots, the BOE's tracking system will also indicate whether a voter's ballot was accepted as valid or invalid. Previously, voters would have to call the BOE's office for this information. Providing this information online is an enormous improvement for the voter and saves time on the phone for BF BOE staff as well. This level of transparency gives voters information that will help them advocate for themselves and make sure their vote is counted. The BOE has also introduced specially created absentee ballot boxes that will be located at every early voting and election po day poll site and every BOE office. Voters will now have, will have more flexibility with regard to transmitting their absentee ballot to the BOE, given that the U United States Postal Service has indicated they expect a huge volume of election related mail. Many voters have also voiced their concerns regarding the uncertainty and lack of trust regarding the USPS. Physical absentee ballot boxes allow voters this in-person delivery option while also ensuring limited exposure to other voters and poll workers. These changes will make the process more efficient and transparent, which will hopefully limit the number of questions the BOE receives in the weeks leading up to the election and vastly improves the absentee ballot process for New Yorkers. While a record-breaking number of voters chose to vote via absentee ballot in June, the majority still chose to vote in person on election day. The BOE has done a great job of publicizing poll worker recruitment efforts to reflect the increased turnout in November. They're in the process of training these new poll workers. It is vital that poll workers are properly and completely trained on how to interact with voters ahead of election day. We believe that early voting is the safest and most effective way for New Yorkers to cast a ballot in person. The CFB through our New York City Election Consortium co-founded with the Mayor's Office of Democracy NYC initiative are planning a robust advertising and social media campaign to encourage early voting. Early voting provides a chance for voters to properly socially distance and minimize the wait time associated with presidential elections. Assuring the ballot is accessible to all New Yorkers must remain a priority. In our VAC hearing, voters with disabilities testified that an abs accessible absentee ballot was burdensome and required voters to own a printer and obtain legal printing paper. While the June election was the first time an accessible absentee ballot was available, we encouraged the state BOE to improve the accessible ba absentee ballot process for voters with disabilities to better meet voters' needs and allow accessible means to receive, mark, and submit an absentee ballot privately and independently from home. To reiterate, the state legislature and BOE have taken significant steps to improve the electoral process ahead of the November election based on what we saw in June. Under historically difficult circumstances, the BOE has found ways to deliver, deliver meaningful administrative solutions to challenges that could not have been predicted when 2020 started. The work is not yet done, but they've made changes that will make a practical difference for voters in the fall. The work has not gone unnoticed and we hope to work with them to further improve the absentee ballot voting process for future elections. While this hearing is dedicated to the 2020 election, I would like to add that we have fielded many questions about the CFB's plans for ranked choice voter voting, voter education, and outreach for the 2021 elections. We have created a planning roadmap and have already begun preparing content. Our staff will use 2020 to conduct research and create materials to roll out to our community partners in early 2021, including a train the trainer presentation, toolkit, one pager and voter FAQ, and an explainer video about why this new method of voter voting benefits voters. We will also work with our partners in the New York City's elections consortium to create a field plan for community outreach to be sure we can effectively educate every community in advance of the first ranked choice voting elections. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much. I, I only have uh, two quick questions. Uh, I think I got ahead of uh, the council to the committee. Did I, CJ? Feel free to proceed. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Director Lopez, thank you uh, for all that you do. Thank you for 
um, the leadership uh, in the campaign finance for CFP. I only have uh, literally actually just one question. Um, you, you did so good in your presentation, you literally <laughs> answer my questions. Uh, has, and it comes down to uh, OMB. Has, have you had discussions with OMB regarding uh, the current budget uh, shortfall for CFP? Yes, we've adapted. I mean, as with everyone in the city, we know that the budget shortfall is a serious matter and we have um, adjusted and adapted our plans to uh, uh, meet the changes to our budget that were adopted by the council and, uh, and implemented by OMB. So we are ready to continue to do the good work that we do, perhaps slightly reduced way, but we are uh, certainly preparing to do the voter education and outreach that, and the work that we do for the candidates as we've always done in all past elections. So you, you're fully confident that we'll have the funding for the matching program that is going to be uh, taking place in light of the fact that we have so many elections next year. Um, you, you feel confident? Yes, I mean, we, uh, as you know, the there is special powers in the charter, provisions in the charter, allowing for uh, protection of the public fund. Um, we requested the public funds from OMB. We are providing them with quarterly estimates of what we expect to need for each quarter in the terms of public funds. And there is also special budgetary authority in the charter that allows us to require the Department of Finance and OMB to provide additional public funds within um, a short period of time if the need ever arises. But as we anticipate uh, preparing for the 2021 elections and the series of special elections that will likely occur be in 2021 before the June primary, we will be adjusting our estimate and providing those estimates to OMB um, in advance of the first early payment that will happen on December 15th of this year. Well, thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over now back to the committee council in case there's any other questions by my colleagues. And if not, we'll go to the next panelist, but thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. As the Chair mentioned, we'll now turn to council member questions. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you have not yet raised your hand, please do so now. Seeing no hands raised, we'll now turn to testimony from Laura Wood, Special Counsel to the Mayor's Democracy NYC Initiative. Special Counsel Wood, you may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you. My name is Laura Wood and I work at the Democracy NYC Initiative at the Mayor's Office. Thank you so much to the Government Operations Committee and to Chair Cabrera for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to testify. The Democracy NYC initiative aims to increase access to our electoral system for all New York City residents. From voter registration to the act of voting itself, we believe that participation in our democracy must be as simple as possible. This has become particularly important now given the complex burdens that the COVID-19 pandemic has placed on our communities. For that reason, on behalf of the administration, I thank everyone who played a part in what has been a very intense effort this year to run a primary election and gear up for the general election in the middle of this public health crisis. The written testimony I have submitted goes into detail about what we observed during the June primary, both with respect to absentee and in-person voting, much of which was already covered by Mr. Ryan and Ms. Lowprest, and I want to um, commend the City Board of Elections and echo Mr. Ryan's thanks to the BOE staff, who we know have worked incredibly hard under very challenging circumstances these past several months. Um, since the committee has already addressed these issues in depth with the BOE, I will focus on what efforts Democracy NYC undertook for the June primary and what we are planning for the remaining 39 days before the general election. In light of the pandemic, Democracy NYC focused primarily on ensuring that New Yorkers didn't feel like they had to choose between their safety 
and their right to vote. And thus, for the primary, we focused on encouraging all eligible New Yorkers to vote by absentee ballot and distributed uh, educational materials on absentee voting. In early April, in response to the financial and practical limitations of conducting election outreach during COVID-19, um, and as Ms. Loprest alluded to, we partnered with the Campaign Finance Board and other good government groups and advocates to form uh, an elections consortium whose goal is to produce and disseminate consistent and accurate voting information and respond to the ever-changing elections environment. And we've been pleased that members of this committee staff have participated in some of those conversations. For the primary, the consortium was able to produce public service announcements, social media toolkits, and FAQ documents. We shared these materials with the city and state board of elections to ensure accuracy and consistency with their messaging. Additionally, in partnership with the Civic Engagement Commission, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit, and the Campaign Finance Board, Democracy NYC was able to hold texting days of action to educate people on voting by mail. We placed advertisements and PSAs on social media, on Link NYC kiosks, and um, on television streaming services such as Hulu. We sent a letter with voting information to public school parents via the Department of Education. Um, we sent notify NYC text messages about voting by mail, and we developed reference materials in 13 languages to assist voters with requesting and completing absentee ballots. In the lead up to the general election, we are again partnering with the Civic Engagement Commission to produce two new um, PSAs, including a Know Your Rights PSA that covers language and ADA rights for those voting in person, and an early voting PSA to encourage voters to utilize this option. The PSAs will be offered in 13 languages, shared with our advocacy and elected partners, and promoted on social media and video streaming services. We will also produce PSAs and educational graphics to educate voters on all three voting options, including voting absentee, voting early, and voting in person. In partnership with Link NYC, Democracy NYC will showcase a graphic with all three voting options citywide. We will be happy to share these materials with council members for distribution to constituents. Additionally, we held a texting day of action using the peer-to-peer -peer texting tool known as Hustle to encourage people to sign up to become poll workers and language interpreters, or to apply, I should say. Our team of volunteers reached out to voters um, between the ages of 18 to 29 in various neighborhoods in New York, and over 300 of the people we texted that day indicated that they intended to be election day workers. Of course, the first step in participating in our democracy is registering to vote. Um, due to COVID-19, we've seen a severe drop-off in voter registration so far this year. And in light of that, we are making a big push to help voters register ahead of the October 9th deadline for the general election. For National Voter Registration Day, which was just this past Tuesday, we partnered with the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit to conduct a week of outreach. With the help of volunteers, we used the Hustle texting tool to reach thousands of unregistered eligible New Yorkers in neighborhoods with low registration and, insist them in regi and assist them in registering. We also worked with Small Business Services and the New York City Central Labor Council to partner with small businesses in neighborhoods to serve as voter registration hubs so that New Yorkers who visit those establishments can access voter registration materials. And later today, we will be joining State Senator Zelnor Myrie and others at Medgar Evers College to conduct an in-person voter registration drive. Finally, we will soon roll out a voter registration PSA featuring the Campaign Finance Board's TurboVote platform, which allows users to begin their voter registration online. 
after the October 9th voter registration deadline, we will continue to use phone banking, peer-to-peer -peer texting, and relational organizing tools to help New Yorkers make and commit to voting plans and provide absentee and early voting in education and information. In particular, we will be emphasizing that early voting is a safe, effective, and convenient way to vote. Um, I also want to touch on an issue that came up during Mr. Ryan's testimony and which we spoke about last year after the November general. As I'm sure um, the chair recalls, since last fall, the administration has expressed concerns on multiple occasions about the use of DOE schools as early voting sites, including at the hearing that this committee held last fall. And I wanna be clear that the administration has no issue with the use of schools on election day itself. Um, our understanding is that there will be more than 700 schools that are used for voting that day. For the June primary, we consented to the use of schools for early voting because the school buildings were sadly empty as everyone knows. Um, we were very surprised in early September to learn that despite repeated requests to, to select alternative sites, City BOE was actually planning to move forward and use 20 school buildings and 10 learning bridges locations for early voting during the general election. We understand that the City BOE is facing the challenge of running a hugely important election during a pandemic, but we think there was ample time to select more appropriate locations. And one needs to look no farther than Queens to see that it is possible to have an early voting program without using school sites. With large institutions such as Madison Square Garden and the Barclays Center stepping up to serve as early voting sites, it's clear that there are plenty of venues and buildings across the city that should be approached for early voting. Buildings with children that are hosting school instruction should not top the list. Although the administration will do everything in our power to ensure that voting happens as smoothly and safely as possible, it is our position that the BOE can and should find alternatives to schools for early voting going forward. We have repeatedly offered our assistance in this regard, and although BOE has never been receptive to these offers, we stand ready and willing to assist them. After the general election, Democracy NYC will continue our work to make elections as accessible as possible for all New Yorkers. As we look towards the implementation of ranked choice voting, special elections in early 2021, and the citywide primaries in June, we plan on working closely with our government and advocate partners to make sure voters have the tools they need to be informed and active participants in our democracy. In all of these efforts, the administration is prepared to assist and support the Board of Elections. In conclusion, we are grateful for the opportunity to participate in this hearing and for the opportunity to hear feedback from all those contributing today. We will be listening closely for ways in which the administration can continue to assist in ensuring that election administration goes smoothly. I would like to thank the committee members for their time today, thank Chair Cabrera for his leadership and thank the entire city council for their attention to voting accessibility for New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear questions from Chair Cabrera. Special Counsel Wood, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Chair. Thank you, uh, Special Counsel, for uh, your, your very detailed testimony. I really, really appreciate it. I, I just have uh, two uh, questions. Um, that I'm, I'm ho hopefully we could uh, get a good answer here. What has been the results of the internal conversations between the mayor's office and the Department of Corrections to ensure that justice involved eligible voters have access to the ballot and are able to vote in time for the November 3rd election? Thank you, Chair Cabrera. Uh, I, kn I know that our, uh, obviously that challenge has become even more intense given the COVID pandemic. And so some of the work that we've done in the past to do in-person voter registration has not been possible due to new procedures put in place by the Department of Corrections. Um, but we have been in close touch with them about making sure that anyone who is in one of those facilities has accurate information about voting and has the ability 
to cast an absentee ballot, assuming they are eligible. Um, and our understanding is that voter registration forms are also being distributed to eligible uh, residents who are not yet registered to vote. Uh, and I'd be happy to follow up with more detail because I, I believe DOC has recently written a report on this subject. So I'd be happy to share it with the committee staff. Thank you. I would really appreciate uh, that detail uh, steps that, that you're taking. Uh, let me just uh, pause uh, quickly here to recognize that we've been joined uh, by council member Donis Rodriguez from Manhattan. Uh, my, uh, Director Ryan uh, indicated that there were cultural institutions that were unwilling to serve as post sites. Uh, is, is, can the administration help us to put a, a healthy pressure uh, in negotiating with the cultural institutions to step up in light of the fact of what you mentioned with the schools? Absolutely. Uh, we would be delighted to see more cultural institutions step up to serve as early voting sites. Um, you know, I understand that that these institutions are facing huge challenges right now, but we all are in this city. Um, and, and now when we have fewer people going to those institutions and some of those institutions still close to the public, it, it just makes logical sense to use more of them for voting. And we have had numerous conversations both with individual institutions as well as our partners at the Department of Cultural Affairs about this topic. We will continue to, to keep advocating for that. Um, and and you know, as I've, as I've shared with the Board of Elections, I hope that they will continue to try to make that work as well. Um, you know, they have the ability to designate poll sites under the election law, some, some of those um, entities can then challenge the designation. But I know that in the past, there have, there have been situations where an entity initially challenged it and ultimately the parties were able to work things out. Um, and I'll just point again to the borough of Queens where we've had the Museum of the Moving Image serve as an early voting poll site now for several elections. I think, you know, I, I think at first they were nervous and they decided to take the leap. And I think it's actually been a boon to the institution. And mm -hmm. I think voters really enjoy voting in a, in a place like that. And so we've, we've seen that it can work. Uh, the Brooklyn Museum is another example. Um, so yes, we are, we are very hopeful that we can encourage more of our cultural institutions to participate. I agree with you, Special Counsel. I remember when the NYCID came out uh, and many people were able to go for the first time to many institutions for free. Actually, it created larger traffic and they were able to, you know, economically speaking, uh, physically speaking, it turned out to, to benefit them. Uh, so I, I think... Um, I, I think it will be wise for cultural institutions uh, to do that. I have one last question before I turn it over. I know we have uh, questions by at least one colleague that I can see. Um, and that is, what conversations are you having with OMB uh, to ensure that elections are fully funded in New York City? Um, well, our understanding is that, you know, al although the, the city is obviously facing a very dire fiscal crisis, um, OMB has committed to ensuring that the Board of Elections and, and the Campaign Finance Board and, and others who are involved in election administration and, and voter education and outreach have the resources that they need. Um, and, and we at, at Democracy NYC keep in close touch with OMB about those matters. So, you know, I think there's, there's probably ways that we can achieve cost savings while, you know, still ensuring that we are not shortchanging voters. And, and obviously at this critically important moment for uh, our democracy and elections, we, that, is, that must be our top priority. Um, but I, I, as of now, I, I am confident that the Board of Elections will have the resources that they need. Well, thank you for that report uh, that warms my heart. 
especially something so important as elections. Uh, let me turn it over uh, to the committee council. I know that we have uh, at least one question from one of our colleagues. Thank you, Chair. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you have not yet raised your hand, please do so now. First, we'll hear from council member Rodriguez. Council member, please begin. Time starts now. Thank you. What is it that you take from Democracy NYC when it comes to a, the project and idea to allow New Yorkers with green cards and working papers to vote in municipal election in 21? Uh, that's something that already is happening in other towns in a state such as Maryland. Um, thank you, Council Member Rodriguez, for that question. I know that that's been a topic of interest to many New Yorkers for some time now. Um, I think one of the challenges is that um, there has been a concern during the current federal administration about the use of certain data and how it might be used adversely to impact people who might not be citizens and, and would be um, registering to vote. Um, but, you know, I, I think assuming it can be done lawfully I, and, and without harm to any individuals, it's certainly something that should be, you know, that can and should be discussed. Um, but I think there's, there's certainly precautions that we would need to, to make sure are in place before that happens. And, and, and my understanding is that there may need to be changes to either the state law or the state constitution before that is permitted. Yeah. Well, as you know, the federal law already established that the city, I mean, the city and the state are the one that make, have the right to decide who votes in, in the local elections. And there's some towns already in Maryland where they already allow it, 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 individuals that they have working papers or a green card to vote in the election. But I'm happy to continue you know, the conversation. I hope that this is another legacy that uh, we can see under this administration and make New York City the largest municipality that will empower individuals who pay taxes to also to elect who are the leaders that will be picking out the garbage who make the decision and the education of the kids. So this is about no taxation without representation. Uh, my, my other question is on relation to uh, as someone that lived the experience of being a candidate in the uh, election back in June, one of the concerns that I have or suggestion is why don't we allow voters who vote in the early voting period of time to vote in any polling site in the community where they live? Because by doing the way of how it's being established back in June, is suppress voting rights. Yeah, uh, we very strongly support the uh, City Board of Elections moving to a countywide early voting system so that anyone who lives in, in say the borough of Manhattan could vote at any poll site in that borough. Um, my understanding is that there are some technical software related issues relating to ballot testing that make that challenging for the Board of Elections. Um, but I, I, I know that that is certainly the preference of the election law statute that, um, that established early voting in the first place. And we're talking with the, the BOE regularly about that um, and with members of the state legislature about whether changes to state law might be necessary um, and, as well as the state board of elections. So, you know, I don't know how quickly it can be done, but it absolutely should be done. And, and my understanding is that almost every other county, if not every other county outside of New York City now permits people to vote at any poll site in that county. I, I think Westchester just changed their system recently. So I very much hope that we can get there as well. I hope that we know that we have enough time to do it. I get it when we brought to the attention back in June because it was like in a two months before, but knowing that this election is coming months from now, I hope that in being New York City, the central technology after the Silicon Valley, 
I hope that also we can get the software that the Board of Election can get us to implement, allow, expand the voting right through borough, through the each borough. So thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I'd now like to welcome Doug Douglas Kellner to testify. After Douglas Kellner, I'll be calling on Sarah Goff and then Megan Ahern. Douglas Kellner, you may begin when ready. Uh, thank you. Time starts time. now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, as many of you know, I serve as uh, co-chair of the State Board of Elections, and so I'm just uh, one of uh, four commissioners for the State Board. So I'm um, giving my own remarks, and I don't necessarily speak for um, uh, the entire bipartisan board. Um, I submitted a uh, fairly uh, detailed memorandum uh, to the city commissioners making recommendations uh, for the November general election. And I'm um, uh, pleased to see that on um, uh, one of those four topics, uh, uh, I think that there's been a very, very good process, uh, progress, and I would commend the board, and that's in dealing with uh, the absentee ballots. That um, I do not believe that we are going to repeat the uh, problems that we had in June, that the uh, City Board of Elections, uh, as uh, uh, Mike Ryan and Dawn Sandow uh, reported earlier, have um, brought in uh, a number of uh, positive innovations that uh, are uh, going to um, avoid uh, repetition of those problems. And it appears that they should be able to um, meet the very daunting challenge of uh, the substantial increase in absentee ballots. Um, uh, as to the other two um, main issues that I raised, uh, though I have uh, more concerns. Um, uh, uh, in particular, I have been uh, concerned over the years with uh, New York City's non-compliance with the 30-minute uh, rule that uh, no voter should have to wait more than 30 minutes at a local poll site. And um, while the city has done some things that will make marginal improvements, uh, they have not addressed the fundamental problems. In particular, they've not taken up the authority that they have um, to um, uh, employ uh, workers for part-time shifts and uh, to uh, change the uh, organization of poll sites um, to make them more efficient and to reduce uh, waiting in line. Um, as to the canvas, I will uh, uh, simply uh, remind the city board that the statutory deadline for uh, completing the canvas is November 28th. Uh, which is a week earlier than uh, what uh, Mr. Ryan had uh, talked about. And I point out that that's the Friday after Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, State Board has made it very clear that the counties must uh, gear up to meet that. Um, finally, uh, I am somewhat disappointed to report that the New York City Board has not complied with uh, two of the governor's executive orders uh, requiring reports to the State Board of Elections. Um, executive Order 202.58 uh, required a report on staffing needs and the State Board has not received that report. Um, 202.61 uh, required a report on drop boxes. And well, while it is very clear from Ms. Sandow's uh, uh, and Mr. Ryan's testimony that they do have the Dropbox program licked. And I'm uh, pleased with their efforts on that. They have not provided the report. 
which is uh, 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 required by the governor. And um, uh, it just raises another concern about the lack of attention to detail. Um, Thanks, Byron. Um, and I could report on what's going on with ranked choice voting from the state board's point of view, but uh, um, Mr. Chair, I recognize my time has expired. Thank you. We will now turn to questions from Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I had a, a quick question in regards to uh, something that I mentioned earlier uh, to uh, Executive Director Ryan and Council Member Danny's uh, brought it up uh, just about five minutes ago, which is in regards to having early voting county wise. Um, and here in the Bronx, we can probably have 15 sites, maybe 20. Um, it is sometimes convenient, as you know, to just go after work or during lunch uh, to a site that might be even closer to the particular home. The, the explanation that we have been given is that they're waiting on the state board to grant them permission uh, regarding the machine, if I understood this right. Uh, maybe you could clarify. Um, regarding uh, the memory, there's a lack of memory in the current machines uh, to be able to, to do so. Uh, and so can you help us with that? Where are we? Can we move the needle so we could have it for June? Have it set up for June? It seems uh, unreasonable, I think, at this point to have it ready for November. All right. Um, the, the um, Mr. Ryan's testimony is correct that the uh, current ballot marking device does have uh, limited memory and uh, that uh, uh, any one given ballot marking device cannot be used borough wide. Now I have pointed out that uh, an alternative solution is that within an early voting site to um, divide the ballot marking uh, devices by uh, locality so that you have ballot marking devices programmed. Uh, you, you may need to have uh, five or six ballot marking devices dividing up the uh, uh, ballot styles for the county. Um, also, um, they could do a workaround by instead of having a separate ballot style for each election district, to um, uh, change the programming slightly in order to have the election district um, as a uh, separate factor in the um, uh, uh, in the software for uh, aggregating the votes, so that um, uh, when to reduce the substantially reduce the number of ballot styles. Um, the city solution is that they are proposing uh, to purchase the uh, ESNS Express Vote XL, uh, which is controversial. There are several uh, uh, election integrity advocates around the state who have been um, uh, challenging that that uh, machine uh, does not have uh, sufficient ballot security. Um, it has been going through the state board certification process for more than a year now, and not all of the issues raised by the technical experts at the state board have been addressed to certify that machine. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that informative uh, answer. Uh, let me, I know you wanted to talk about ranked choice voting. I'm glad uh, that um, we'll have that time right now. Will the city DOE require state certification for ranked choice voting software? Well, to secure, procure, and if so, when does the state board expect the certification will be made? All right. Notwithstanding my requests for almost a year now, the city has not requested any particular certification, that they have only submitted very generalized plans. And we can respond by saying that 
if they change the software on the DS200 that actually counts the votes, that has to go through a certification process. And at best, that certification process can be done in six months. And it could take much longer if there are issues. Um, if um, they are dealing only with software in the vote aggregation process, in other words, the separate software that counts the votes once the ballots have been scanned, that does not require state certification, but it still requires testing and review. And that process can be done very promptly. But as of this date, the city has not yet submitted any particular proposal for the state to review and respond to. I'll definitely follow up with uh, with the BOE, uh, with, uh, Mike Ryan, regarding that. Uh, I was under the impression that they did. Uh, so they, maybe they thought they did. Well, it, but it they was, submitted uh, a general plan, right. and the state board responded with questions asking for more particulars. But for the first time today, I heard Mike Ryan say, no, we haven't locked into any particular plan yet. And now we're thinking of going to other vendors. Well, ESNS has not submitted a specific package for the state board to review. And it seems like the city board is still reviewing that process. And I think that's a good idea for the city to look at a, uh, the possibility of additional vendors, but we're running out of time. Two quick questions, because uh, I know we got we have more uh, uh, people who want to speak in the public session. Has the state board uh, proposed providing postage paid envelopes for absentee ballots? Uh, what was the reasoning uh, against providing prepaid postage in the November election? And to what extent has the state DOE coordinated with the USDS? Um, I think you need to talk to the governor about um, why uh, they did not include um, uh, uh, prepaid postage uh, this time around. Um, uh, Were you my, consulted? Was the state uh, BOE consulted by the governor's office? Well, we're, we're, we're consulted, but the governor decides. Um, right, right. <laughs> And, and uh, sure uh, my, my best guess is that it was really a budget issue, that uh, right. the postage was an unfunded mandate on the county governments, and many counties were objecting to that. Um, and there is lots of coordination going on with the post office. The post office has been very responsive to the State Board of Elections. There are lots of problems, just like um, the difficulty it is for uh, the City Board of Elections to train uh, 37,000 inspectors. Uh, the um, supervisors at the post office have the same problem in making sure that their directives are actually followed um, throughout the system. And uh, most recently, there was a court order uh, uh, requiring uh, much more thorough uh, uh, compliance by the post office with its own guidelines. Um, and uh, um, as I say, we're working closely with them and doing the best we can. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the updates. Uh, very informative uh, to hear, uh, you know, as someone who has direct uh, information in the state board. And, and thank you for all the work that you do there as well. And let me turn it back to the committee council. Thank you, Chair. Next, we will hear from Sarah Goff followed by Megan Ahern and then Rachel Bloom. Sarah Goff, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Sarah Goff, Deputy Director of Common Cause New York. I would like to thank the committee chair and members of this committee for convening today's hearing. Common Cause New York is a nonpartisan citizens lobby and a leading force in the battle for honest and accountable government for over 50 years. Consonant with our overall mission, we've consistently worked to improve the accessibility, transparency, and verifiability in our democratic processes at the state, city, and national level. As other folks have testified earlier, 
uh, we are largely in agreement that while there was definitely unforced errors along the way, the Board of Elections did a credible job of navigating unparalleled circumstances in June and have done their best to rapidly scale up an Sarah, I think we lost you there. Chair, if you'd like, we can move on to the next panelist. And yes, please, and we'll have her back when she's, she's back okay. on. So next, we will hear from Megan Ahern, followed by Rachel Bloom, and then Perry Grossman. Megan Ahern, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Megan Ahern. I'm the program director for NYPIRG, or New York Public Interest Research Group. Thank you for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to testify on this important issue. I'll focus my time today on recent announcements and orders and what the city council can do to help protect and expand the electorate this November. First, we commend the New York City Board of Elections for unveiling its ballot tracking tool. During the June primaries, the single biggest complaint we heard from voters was that they didn't receive their ballots in time. Voters who applied together didn't receive ballots at the same time, and some arrived after election day. We hope that the ballot tracking system can keep voters out of the dark, and we also ask if it could be used to harness, um, if it could be used to shed light on any discrepancies or emerging problems so they may be caught early and addressed. Such information can be organized by borough and assembly district and separated from personally identifiable information made available to the public. The first absentee ballots have just been mailed out in NYC, so this data should be rolling in. We urge the city council to explore this possibility. Second, thanks to our colleagues at the League of Women Voters, absentee ballot curing procedures will give voters the opportunity to fix an error. Absentee voters don't have access to in-person live poll workers, obviously, who might be able to spot or help correct administrative errors, and simple fixes should be available to mail-in voters also. Third, during the June primaries, a fair number of races took more than a month of ballot counting to call. Increased general election turnout could draw that month-long count perhaps into the new year, although we're hearing mid-December from the BOE today, but late November from Commissioner Kellner. The City Council should seek to promote a nonpartisan post-election day election protection project. The project could watchdog the process, help to provide regular public updates, and perhaps certify whether or not the Board of Elections is properly and consistently counting ballots across all five boroughs. We urge the New York City Comptroller to also produce an audit of the City Board of Elections and their performance in this year's elections. Of course, adding resources to the hand counting effort is badly needed and the New York State Board of Elections has urged the state to provide 50 million in additional funding so that November's elections run smoothly. As of now, it's not clear if the governor will provide this, but we hope that the city council can do all it can to ensure the city board has the resources to do its job. We uh, finally urge the city council to wage and compel the New York City Board of Elections to wage a massive voter education campaign that focus on, focuses on making a plan to vote early to allow for, um, and allow for wiggle room or an option B, promoting early voting as a way to avoid long lines and skip the post office. Time expired. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just to wrap up this one point, uh, learning how to properly fill out stuff, sign and date and return absentee ballots and awareness of voters' rights and what resources and recourse voters have if they run into an issue. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Rachel Bloom, followed by Perry Grossman and then Kate Doran. Rachel Bloom, uh, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and members of the New York City Council. My name is Rachel Bloom and I'm the Director of Public Policy and Programs at Citizens Union. We thank you for inviting us here today. Um, Citizens Union is an independent and nonpartisan democratic reform organization that brings New Yorkers together to strengthen our democracy and improve our city and state. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today about voting in the November election in a pandemic. Um, I'm going to be as brief as possible and try not to repeat things that other people have spoken about. Um, so I, first off, I do wanna extend my thanks um, to the 
uh, to the BOE. Um, they've been placed in an incredibly difficult process um, that they have been tasked with. And, um, you know, we thank them for doing their best and working incredibly long hours to make sure that um, New Yorkers can cast their ballots safely both in June and in November. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is postage paid return, which has come up and some of us have it, some of you have asked questions about it. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of confusion about this. As we know, in the June primary, Governor Cuomo mandated that postage paid, ret postage paid return be paid for all absentee ballots. Um, and that same accommodation has not been made for the general election. Um, we request that the New York City Board of Elections provide postage paid return for absentee ballots. This is within their capacity and not heard of. Um, New York City already provides postage paid return on voter registration forms, which other counties do not. Um, we strongly encourage uh, the BOE to do so, and we fear that without it, people will send in their applications without postage paid return. Um, if that is not possible, which we hope it is, um, our second recommendation, which I know has also been talked about today, is that the BOE tell every borough the cost of mailing in their ballot. Commissioner Ryan said it was just going to be a 55 cent um, a 55 cent stamp to to mail it back. Uh, you know, it's an oversized envelope. I don't think that that is accurate. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, um, he suggested that people should just go to the post office and wait in line. I think the whole point right now is that people don't want to be in places. That's why they're requesting absentee ballots in record numbers. Um, and so we should be able to make sure we should ensure that they can cast their ballots remotely. Um, uh, and, and safely. I only have 45 seconds left. I want to talk a little bit about um, poll worker recruitment of young people. Um, they've The BOE has really been trying to get young people to work as poll workers. Um, and they're there's, we've heard from many youth groups that many of their members who want to sign up to work find the process unclear and discouraging. Um, one of the things we recommend that the BOE tailor its messaging for young and new poll workers to add clear and informative explanations before voters apply about the steps ahead, the expected timeline, and the kind of training they will receive. Applicants should also be informed about the status of their application once they arrived. These changes have minimal costs and will increase the effectiveness of the recruitment process. Time expired. One I just want to say that one thing now, we allow 17 year olds to sign up to become poll workers, but they need to have a paper sign off from their school principal and working papers from guidance counselors to apply for poll work. During a pandemic when schools are shut down or function remotely and educators are under tremendous pressure, this cumbersome paper process is an almost impossible task for teens. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next we will hear from Perry Grossman followed by Kate Doran and then Hannah Klein. Harry Grossman, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Okay, thanks so much to the chair, to the committee. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to be here and I appreciate um, you holding these hearings and, and showing a real interest in making sure that New Yorkers uh, are able to vote and, and to vote safely in these uh, very challenging times. And I wanna echo a lot of what other folks have said. I think we're all doing the best we can in these, in these very difficult times. And first I wanna make sure that everyone gets credit because the pandemic has really accelerated uh, a lot of innovations, especially as it's come to, to absentee voting. New Yorkers right now, they have more ways to apply for absentee ballots more ways to return their absentee ballots and more ways to make sure their absentee ballots get counted. And th those are all positive things. Um, you know, I also wanna highlight, we've seen the gradual expansion of early voting. Um, and I wanna give the Board of Elections credit for expanding the number of early voting sites. Mike has, uh, has been really adamant about wanting to get credit for that and he deserves it. It's hard to get early voting sites to commit to, to, to being involved uh, and, and to providing that public service, and, and especially now uh, because the pandemic makes things so difficult. But the number of early voting sites is still not where it should be. The goal for 2020 was to have over 100 early voting sites and we're just not there. And turnout is way up. And as we're seeing, early voting is a critical tool. It's a critical tool even if we're not in a pandemic, it is a desperately critical tool when we are in one because we want to alleviate some of the pressure on the absentee voting system 
And we also want to make sure that we don't have long lines and crowds on election day. So, um, you know, there are still neighborhoods that are really badly served by early voting. Uh, Inwood and Marble Hill, for example. Um, you know, if you live in Marble Hill, your closest early voting site is on 182nd or 168th Street, and you're only assigned to one of those. So, um, you know, th th that's a pain. But the fact is, we need to have a more stable supply of early voting sites, and we need to have a more stable supply of poll workers to man those early voting sites. Um, you know, the city council should do what it can to place more pressure on potential early voting sites, things that have ties to the city, tax incentives and whatnot, to offer themselves as, as early voting sites and to enforce uh, penalties against those places that should be early voting sites, uh, but aren't. The one place I'm gonna express some real upset though is voter registration. Voter registration is way down and we have made absolutely no strides to make it better with the exception of the remarkable effort by uh, NYC Votes, the Campaign Finance Board, to partner with TurboVote. But we're down about 50% over 2016. Um, and we've done nothing to remedy that. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Kate Doran, followed by Hannah Klein, and then Paul Westrick. Kate Doran, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon to all. My name is Kate Doran. I serve on the board of the League of Women Voters of the state of New York and in New York City. My local league is the LWVNYC where I am the election specialist. We are entirely volunteer led. So you're unlikely to meet any one of us in New York who's not a volunteer. Uh, these are agonizing times for lawmakers and voters in New York. We've seen challenges and change in the last seven months that rival and in some ways exceed the changes we remember from 2010 when the New York moved to voting on paper ballots. First, we thank you all, the OMB and the taxpayers of the city of New York for fully funding the New York City Board of Elections and the Campaign Finance Board. We know that other jurisdictions in the state have not been so fortunate. Now there's not much time left before voting begins. What's important now is to educate voters. Lines could be longer than they were in 2016 because of social distancing and high turnout. Counting the unprecedented numbers of absentee ballots will take time and we may not have results on election nights. So please encourage your constituents to be patient. The league is working to get eligible citizens registered to vote. We will then shift focus to voting early and reminders of how to complete absentee ballots. Chair Cabrera, you asked earlier, Mike Ryan, about how the public found out about the uh, voting portal. Well, all of us in the voter coalition and the voter advocates, we did a heck of a job on our own websites and our own social media posts. And we got the, the information out and the board is doing its job now. We applaud the New York City Board of Elections for the speedy and successful upgrades to its website. Now it is the go-to website for all the necessary information voters need and it's voter friendly. We hats off to Gail Brewer. She started all that off. Looking forward now, we challenge all of you to work with your Democratic and Republican county leaders to make suggestions for changes at the grassroots level. Specifically, we urge you to look at election law section 3-404, election inspectors and poll clerks. Voters deserve to have elections transparently run by their well-trained and not necessarily partisan neighbors. The League of Women Voters stands ready to participate and assist you in all of these efforts going forward. Thank you very, very much for inviting me to comment this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I believe Sarah Goff is back on the line. So we'll go to Sarah Goff next. And then after that, I'll be calling on Hannah Klein and then Paul Westrick. Sarah Goff, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Your time starts now. 
Apologies, the joys of technology. So I will quickly resume where I assume I got cut off, but in essence, we were incredibly pleased to see that several recommendations and lessons learned have been quickly implemented for the November election. And that included changes to improve voter confidence and absentee voting. As the director of the New York City Board mentioned, it's investing in the appropriate equipment to count absentee ballots, increasing public confidence and transparency by adding this new ballot tracking function so voters can track their ballot in real time, and then prominently displaying the absentee ballot drop-off boxes at early voting sites and election day poll sites. As has already been mentioned, this is critically important for many voters who, excuse me, may expect return paid postage for their absentee ballots um, and may not be able to financially afford to do so or are simply quite frankly uncomfortable heading to the post office in the middle of a pandemic. So these changes will be incredibly helpful to voters. The other two things I just wanted to highlight quickly is an increased and concerted effort to engage the public and engage in a comprehensive voting education and outreach program to make sure that voters know about all of their options to vote in November. And then we were also very pleased to see that there's been a <clears throat> intense campaign to boost younger poll worker recruitment for the November election cycle. We believe that these changes are steps in the right direction and will only serve to secure our elections in November. Since other folks have touched on ranked choice voting, I do just wanna spend a minute on the work that Common Cause and our partners in city government and other nonprofits are doing at this point in time, as this is obviously a topic of conversation as we head into 2021. We have been training community-based partners, candidates and campaigns who are running in the 21 cycle on ranked choice voting, how they can use it for their campaigns and for their communities. Obviously, we are basically laser focused on the November election and we'll switch into high gear as soon as we clear the November election to begin our borough-wide voter education plan. So a lot of the feedback that we've been getting from community partners has been, they're very interested in ranked choice voting, they're ready to go, but they wanna wait until after the November election. So everyone who can safely uh, and securely cast their ballot is able to do so with zero confusion. So that is in part why we have been waiting, but we are working closely with folks over at Democracy NYC and the Campaign Finance Board, along with a host of community Time expired. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we will be hearing from Hannah Klein, followed by Paul Westrick. Hannah Klein, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairperson Cabrera and members of the committee. My name is Hannah Klein and I serve as a fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law in the Democracy Program. I'd like to thank the committee for holding this hearing. The Brennan Center and the Infectious Disease Society of America have partnered to release guidelines for healthy in-person voting, a set of nonpartisan recommendations which provide a blueprint for election administrators so they can develop best practices for making polling locations as safe as possible during the pandemic. The following recommendations for safely administering the 2020 general election are based on guidelines from the CDC and the Brennan Center and IMSA guidelines. First, election administrators must ensure there are enough polling locations to meet voter demand. One account of the New York City primary election this year indicated voting sites in New York City had to be moved or closed at the last minute due to the COVID-19 pandemic. A recent report by the Brennan Center found that voters with fewer polling places per voter reported longer wait times to cast their ballots. While in the past, long wait times were disruptive and disenfranchising, now they could also be deadly. As longer wait times can mean a greater risk of exposure to COVID-19. Second, Voting should occur in large, well-ventilated areas that can accommodate physical distancing measures. Large arenas are among the optimal type of spaces for voting sites this year. The Brennan Center was encouraged to see the Board of Elections announce Madison Square Garden and the Barclays Center will serve as polling places for early voting and on election day. This is a significant first step towards protecting voters in Manhattan and Brooklyn from COVID-19 exposure. 
Voters in other boroughs should also have access to voting locations that are adaptable to distancing, such as school gymnasiums, community recreation centers, or convention centers. For the best possible infection control, voting locations should have one-way airflow with separate points of entry and exit for voters. This will also minimize crowd formation. Third, if a voting location is changed, voters should immediately be given individualized notice of a change with a second notice to be given within weeks of the election. Notice should be provided in multiple languages, including those required under Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act. If polling locations are moved out of senior care facilities, plans should be implemented to ensure residents of those facilities are able to cast a ballot. Fourth, inside polling locations, all voters should take proactive steps to remain safe and healthy. This means maintaining appropriate physical distancing of at least, at least six feet, wearing a mask that covers nose and mouth, and practicing good hand hygiene. Polling places must be appropriately cleaned to prevent transmission of the virus with hand sanitizer provided to voters before and after voting, voting booth surfaces and machines sanitized after each use. High touch surfaces such as poll worker stations, door handles and bathrooms should be cleaned with an FDA approved disinfectant approximately every four hours. This fall, we're going to face many difficult choices, but no New Yorker should have to choose between their fundamental right to vote and their health. Voting by mail should be encouraged as the safest option, but now is the time for thoughtful advanced planning on the I part of the board to minimize the risk of COVID transmission at the polls. Thank you again for your time and consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Paul Westrick, followed by Rob Ritchie. Paul Westrick, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Cabrera and members of this committee. I am Paul Westrick, Manager of Democracy Policy at the New York Immigration Coalition. Despite all the barriers, New Yorkers were determined to cast their ballots in the June primary. Unfortunately, we cannot say this, that the New York City Board of Elections shares their commitment to a functional democracy. Once again, immigrant voters were disenfranchised because of the BOE's inability to run an election. Each voter was supposed to have been mailed an absentee ballot. We know that every voter was not. Each voter who requested an absentee ballot was supposed to have received it in time to complete and mail back. We know that every voter did not. Whether absentee or in person, each voter was supposed to have received a complete ballot. We know that every voter did not, disenfranchising untold numbers by preventing them from voting in certain races. Poll sites opened late and poll workers who received little or no training did not know the procedure for accepting in-person absentee ballots. Interpreters were not available at some poll sites. And in a further insult, BOE decided to ignore the legally mandated date to even begin counting ballots. COVID-19 created hardships for the Board of Elections and we fully recognize that, but the pandemic alone is not to blame. Poorly run elections have become the norm in New York City. This is not how elections are run in other states. This is not how elections are run in other counties of this state. And by allowing this to continue, we are undermining our city's democratic process. It is time to dissolve the current Board of Elections and begin anew. State election law allows that, quote, an election commissioner may be removed from office by the governor for cause. Repeatedly failing to administer an election, the core function of any BOE is cause for removal by any reasonable measure. NYIC asked the city council to publicly request the governor remove all 10 New York City Board of Elections commissioners, which will allow this council to appoint 10 new commissioners with subject matter expertise in voting rights, civic engagement, and public administration. The commissioners must, must pledge to meaningfully, meaningfully address the problems voters experience every single election in New York City. And the new commissioners must pledge to adhere to laws passed by the city council and signed by the mayor. New Yorkers deserve a functioning BOE that does not make excuses for repeated failures, can competently run an election, and actually empowers voters to cast their ballots. BOE has shown that they will not reform themselves, so it's time to create a new Board of Elections. Thank you. Thank you. Rob Ritchie, you may begin your testimony upon the Sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, let me uh, go to my written remarks here. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and uh, here we go. So um, I am in President CEO of Fair Vote, an organization I've directed uh, since 1992. Uh, we work on a lot of different issues over the years, um, 
including voter proof registration for 16 year olds and automatic voter registration, but a constant thread of our work has been uh, the issue of ranked choice voting. And I know that this hearing is covering uh, these pressing issues involving the November elections, but I did want to uh, take this opportunity to talk about the next set of elections coming up, which I gather could be as soon as January if special elections for city council um, are uh, scheduled then um, and are under the new charter um, uh, proposal passed last year or should have ranked choice voting. Um, I'll say that Fair Vote has been deeply involved in implementation of ranked choice voting um, in several jurisdictions. Um, and we were particularly involved in the uh, run up to the first use in San Francisco back in 2004, which was uh, the first uh, you know, new adoption in the modern era, big city, uh, a lot of diversity a lot of challenges, and I think a lot of lessons learned. And so in my written testimony, I'm going to share uh, excerpts from a report that we did in 2005 that that highlighted um, important steps to take. And I think that the city has time to take those steps, but that time, of course, is getting shorter and shorter. And there's so many pandemic associated challenges in this year that uh, um, just want to make sure that um, people are aware of the steps that need to be taken. I will say that once you have a good ballot design, we keep seeing a, a very helpful fact that ranked choice voting is easy for voters. Um, sensible poll worker training and timely voter education make it all the better. Um, but um, if you go back, say, just the last three years of elections with, with ranked choice voting, uh, it's been used in the state of Maine for the first time for, for big elections there, 17 cities, five Democratic presidential primaries this year. And in every single instance, all of those uses for three years, voter turnout has exceeded what was expected and voter success with ranked choice voting ballots have as well. So there's a lot of models for we know what works. Um, and I'll also say that you will um, experience the benefits. You know, you have uh, look, looking like a lot of crowded fields, um, uh, uh, a lot of big elections next year with a lot of people running. And what we're seeing is that voters in that environment really get something special from their opportunity. They don't have to look at polls. They don't have to know who's up or who's down. They can just indicate who they most want and who they most want as their second choice and so on. And they've cast the most powerful vote that they can. Um, candidates don't need to do anything special uh, either beyond the fact of something we hope they all do as well, which is just engage with voters effectively. And that's what ranked choice voting uh, creates incentives for. In the um, written remarks, I'll just summarize the steps that I think we saw work well in San Francisco, and uh, I'll, I'll stop my remarks on that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, at this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Seeing no hands raised, I will now turn it over to Chair Cabrera for closing remarks. Thank you, uh, Committee Council. Thank you for your great work uh, and to all the sergeants of arm, all the staff. I wanna personally thank the advocates. Uh, you, you make us better. Uh, literally, your suggestions, your observation, the healthy, the, health, the healthy pressure that you put on, on government uh, to function better because our people deserve better. I salute you. I thank you. Please don't stop. Uh, thank you for pointing out uh, improvements that were made and at the same time where we could get better. And so thank you. I want to thank uh, also the administration, the BOE, uh, CFB uh, for joining us today and looking forward uh, to reviewing all of the testimonies so we could uh, take the proper next steps that we need to take in order so we could have a democratic process that is efficient, effective, uh, fair, and just. And with that, we close today's hearing and have a wonderful day. Thank you, staff, Sergeant of Arms.